and to Dr. Steve Shackley, SRF. And keep those thoughts in mind. For those thoughts will guide your future action. There's an analogy between the successful thinker and the successful marksman. Philosophy. Philosophy by Horace C. Shackley, Senior A. Benjamin Company book. Library of Congress catalog card number 73 to 10,833 ISBN. Cover 0 7502-0372. Paper cover 0 87,502038 X copyright 1973. Boris C. Shackley, Senior All Rights Reserve, published by the Benjamin Company, Inc. 485 Madison Avenue, New York, New York 10,022, printed in the United States of America, first printing, August 1973, second printing, August 1974, third printing, January 1975, fourth printing, September 1975, fifth printing, December 1977, sixth printing, January 1979, seventh printing, September 1979, eighth printing, April 1989, ninth printing, June 1980, tenth printing, April 1981. Dated to my loving wife and constant companion, my Dorothy slash her unfilling love and interest in my work has been a prime motive in my lifelong search to unveil the mysteries of the man-slash-nature relationship. Knowing that whatever I do, she will be at my side, and her supporting thoughts will surround me wherever I am. The comfort of her love, her nazooing way, her warm smile that lights up my day, her shuddering in every way, my Dorothy. Contents page introduction 9 forward 11 I thought 15 I thoughtsmanship 21 I, I birthplace of success 27 I be man slash nature relationship 47 laws of nature 63. Long before the word brainstorming was invented, the Shackley family was utilizing the activity. We Shackleys have another name, or we call it applying thoughtsmanship slash. Throughout the years, we had been exposed to that thoughtsmanship philosophy without quite realizing what it was. We were taught that the very foundation of this philosophy was the golden rule. Yes, do unto others as you would have done do unto you. Simple phrase, a profound thought, and yet as a guiding principle in our life, we found it worked. There's more to this philosophy, for no one principle can be complete unto itself. As the years went by, we joined Dad in a once-a-week discussion period where we shared and participated in an in-depth understanding of his philosophy. What we had taken for granted began to unfold before us in all its simple truths. Dad very patiently and with careful planning explored with us the men-slash-nature relationship. Explored the impact that living in harmony with nature would or could have in our lives. Dad taught us to think for ourselves, to think things out carefully, to direct our thoughts, and to express our lives through thoughtsmanship. Thoughtsmanship has been a lesson plan in our lives that has enabled two boys and their dad to mature together and to share their ideas and goals. Like many other philosophies, the Shackley philosophy did not create three men that are identical images of each other, but allowed each to develop in his own individual way to grow in stature and stand shoulder to shoulder. Dad gave us an invaluable measure of himself through his philosophy and his love. His love and philosophy has shaped our past, present, and future. And to our dad, we say thanks, Dad, for everything. It has been our privilege. Rusty. Shackley, nearly Shackley. Before 
may I suggest that you read this message with the understanding that it is a reflection of one man's life in his search for what man is and why he is. It is a philosophy for living as I have experienced it. Rest assured that there will be nothing said that will tend to alter your religious belief unless it is to strengthen such a belief. The method in which you worship is believed to be your right. Your commitment of devotion to any religious faith or observance should remain a matter of your choice. The foundation of this philosophy is a man slash nature relationship, and I will confine my explorations of man to his physical and mental endowments and the influencing force that nature has upon them. It is important that you recognize not only the beauty of nature, but what it really means in our everyday life. We visualize the products of nature, such as the trees, the flowers, shrubs, all things natural. But do we realize that nature is our sole supplier? She gives us everything. Behind such a realization lies the force that we will explore together. The force that is often too simply called nature is then really an expression of the wealth of other positive forces, the creative force, the life force. Yes, man's life force is creative energy directed in all its activity by the creative intelligence. All living things, man included, are products of nature. Force in man is the same force and is directed by the same creative intelligence that directs all other living things. Man differs from other living things only in his ability to reason. Reason is the intelligent consciousness of man that serves to direct the energies of the life force within us. For over 70 years, ever since I was a young lad, I have been living a most pleasant and profitable relationship with nature, and I trust that you, too, will cultivate such a relationship. You cannot in any way alter such a relationship, but you can make it more realistic by so arranging your thought patterns to bring yourself into closer harmony with nature. Yes, a better understanding of men's relationship with nature will help you meet and overcome the problems that are sure to lie ahead. I cannot take you by the hand and lead you down the trail I have followed these many years. To do so would mean going backward, tackling the problems of years gone by, facing their solutions. Moreover, I cannot, will I, attempt to solve your problem for you. I can only attempt to arouse a consciousness in you that will permit you a better understanding of your own ability to solve your problems. Such information as you may gain from the study of this message should give you the determination to face all your tone rows with firm resolution to win. Your future life will be exactly what you decide to make it, because every thought that has ever been produced by men or ever will be produced is already here on this earth now. We are blanketed by the vibrations of these thoughts. We need only to recognize them, to hear them, to learn to understand them. I can assure you that I know this to be a fact. I have experienced and lived this philosophy these many years. I'm not asking you to accept these statements as something based upon theory. They are facts of life. I have lived by these facts, and nature has never let me down. I do not present these facts, this shackle philosophy, then, to be written quickly for a button, but to help you to produce a formula of life. Take these truths into your mouth by reading them aloud. Chew them well and mix them with past experience and pass them on for complete digestion and assimilation. When the digestive process has been completed, you will find yourself in possession of knowledge that will aid you in living a more natural life. On the other hand, one do not intend to bore you. Most important, I hope to arouse your curiosity. Life begins this moment, what you think you look, what you think you do, what you think you are. What you think you look, what you think you do, what you think you are. What is thought? No one has ever seen a thought. We can only visualize the effect thought has upon us and others. Of one thing, we may be sure, however, thought has an affinity to the physical. Every thought you develop sends an impulse to every tissue, every cell in your body. The body responds, and in this way, thought results in a physical expression. Without thought direction, there would be no voluntary physical action. It is 
applies not only to the physical actions of man, but to the action and reaction of all life existing on this earth to the influences of thought vibrations. We cannot escape the effects of our thoughts upon our well-being, for our life is what we think to make it. Where do thoughts form in the mind? What in the mind? It may be somewhat surprising when I say that there is no such thing as mind. The mind is simply a process, not a thing. We use that process to give expression to our desires. The process of mind is, of course, a very important function. This function produces thought. The brain is not the process of mind. It is a physical organ that is used by both your inner consciousness and your educated consciousness to create impulsive thought. In preparing this message, it is not my desire to refute statements made by any other philosopher or writer. I really wish to share the truths that have been presented to me over the past seven decades of study and research into natural things. If what is related here seems at first contrary to your understanding, I ask that you withhold judgment until you have been presented with all of the facts. My experiences have been recorded in my inner consciousness. Through the process of mind, this acquired knowledge is now being revealed. Try to approach these ideas with an open mind. Do not allow prejudice to blind you. Read every word and read carefully. Weigh every fact on your research scale. The closer one scrutinizes what is said here, the clearer these truths will stand out. As we consider thought, what it is, it is necessary to find the means of closer cooperation between the educated consciousness and the inner consciousness. Since it is the inner consciousness that is the custodian of our memory, it may be well for us to realize that over 90% of our every day activity is handled by our inner consciousness almost involuntarily without a conscious effort on our part. Every thought we have ever produced lies in our storehouse of memory, ideas awaiting our call. However, we need not always put forth a conscious effort to profit by such recall. The inner consciousness automatically uses those stored thoughts to direct our physical action. Yes, I know, we don't always recall the facts we desire exactly when we desire them, but that doesn't mean that they are not there. It usually means that we are keeping our process of mind so busy, just searching for memory, that our inner consciousness has no way of getting the message through to us. How many times have you tried desperately to recall something and failed and have gone about your business doing other things only to discover that suddenly you remember clear and bright? There is only one process in mind and you have kept it so busy trying to remember that there was an open line of communication. That is an expression of the creative intelligence as supplied to man, to every person, only he will listen and receive and become conscious of the thoughts. The thoughts of the universe, of this earth at least, are here and crowding in upon us. All we need to do is listen. I had not seen too many years when I first recognized the bombardment of the creative thought of nature. It started when I was still a boy, lunar with nature. I had always been a lunar with nature. I used to like lying flat on my back in an old haystack out in the fields in spring. Once while doing just that and marveling at the formations of wildfowl overhead, a phenomenon many times greater than, and to ask myself, what makes those geese, ducks, swans, and cranes fly north in the spring of the year? They were guided by some unseen force, I determined, taken back to the place where they were born, the nesting place of the year, before and years before that. They lay their eggs and produce their young, and then in the fall, without roadmaps, they suddenly appeared some. He told them to fly south, so they left their home and flew to the southlands, where it would be warm and comfortable during the cold northern winter nights and days. It was the awakening of my relationship with nature, and I have since cultivated every thought that I could recognize in my inner consciousness, or at least endeavor to do so, and put those thoughts into ideas. It is well that man's educated consciousness becomes aware of that other side of man. It is the inner consciousness that is in constant touch with the creative intelligence, the director of nature. It is well to remember that every thought we produce tends to be given physical expression. Certainly it will have been influencing the expression of your life.
man does not have the power to create thought. He becomes conscious of the creative thoughts and directs them in giving expression to his own activity. Truth of the thoughts man uses as a guide to the expression of life are the thoughts of others. For thoughts are no respecter of persons. There is thought limited by space. This world is blanketed with thoughts. The consciousness simply becomes aware of them and either accepts or rejects them. What we think, we do. There are many different types of thought. Constructive, inventive, creative, optimistic, stimulative, and many other positive types. There are also negative types, destructive, pessimistic, depressing, hateful, and so forth. Men must choose carefully the thoughts he wishes to entertain. Remember, positive thoughts tend to bring much happiness to us and to others, adding to our pleasure of life, while negative thoughts tend to result in a discord of vibrations that will deteriorate the body. The body is no longer a fitting abode, the life force departs. Man brings destruction upon himself. Cooperative thoughts and forgiveness are neutralizers that will give man inner peace. Man must determine to live in harmony with nature. If it's what we think to make it, every cell in the body is subjected to the impulse of thought. Our consciousness responds to such thought impulses and sends motivating energy to such muscles as are needed to carry out the demand of that thought. As the thought is being transmuted into physical expression. Have you ever seen a face turn ashen gray from anger? Or a face flush crimson from embarrassment? Have you ever been frozen to a spot from fear? All of these physical reactions are due to thought what you think you look, what you think you do, what you think you are. As a young man, I enjoyed athletics of all kinds, including boxing. One day, I was walking down the street with my mind on a thesis I was to write that weekend. I was so curious of everything about me. At that moment, a fellow student and a very close friend stepped in front of me and threw a fake punch at my jaw. There was no thought recognition, only a thought of defense. I struck back with dead accuracy and my friend was knocked off his feet. First of all, his head hit the sidewalk with such force that he suffered an SHGH2 fracture of the skull. Imagine my regret. At that moment, instinctive reactions developed through my long training sessions for boxing and stored in my inner consciousness had taken control of my body. Those defensive thoughts were transmuted into the physical and my reaction was automatic. After reading the above facts concerning the transmutation of thought into the physical, you will recognize the need of thought control. Suppose someone did something that caused you to become angry. Anger, of course, is derivative of fear and is one of men's most negative emotions. Those angry thoughts cause the inner consciousness to alert every cell in the body to contract and prepare for fight or flight. It may not be necessary to do either. As long as the angry thought is controlling your actions, every cell in your body will feel the effect. Normal function has been interfered with, and it may take hours for the body to repair the physical damage done by a single thought. On the other hand, the thought of friendliness can cause a sense of relaxation throughout the body, and the relaxed body will function more normally. We will not only feel better, but look better. As thought transmutation into the physical is a confirmed fact. Think of the above illustration. Next time you find yourself becoming angered, thought control, the word control, may strike you where it hurts. For few people have control of their thoughts. People are prone to produce selfish thoughts and then wonder why others disagree with them. Can't you think of other fellows' welfare some of the time? We truly believe that the success building power of the Shackley philosophy is due to the fact that we share our opportunities with other fellow. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Men cannot make progress alone. Progress is the direct result of the service man renders to others. The greater the service rendered, the greater the progress. It all depends upon what you think. Thoughts, as you now know, have a tendency to be transmuted into the physical. The human being has been given dominion for all things pertaining to his personal welfare. Why court disaster by refusing to direct properly your production of thought? You must either produce your own directive thoughts or someone else will produce those thoughts for you. 
to acting upon the thoughts you have experienced in years past. Of course, you are, and 90% of your daily actions are motivated by thoughts experienced. In this message, it is not my desire to refute statements made by any other philosopher or writer. I really wish to share the truths that have been presented to me over the past seven decades of study and research into natural things. If what is related here seems at first contrary to your understanding, I ask that you withhold judgment until you have been presented with all the facts. My experiences have been recorded in my inner consciousness. Through the process of mind, this acquired knowledge is now being revealed. Try to approach these ideas with an open mind. Do not allow prejudice to blind you. Read every word and read carefully, weigh every fact on your recent scale. The closer one scrutinizes what is said here, the clearer these truths will stand out. As we consider thought and what it is, it is necessary to find the means of closer cooperation between the educated consciousness and the inner consciousness. Since it is the inner consciousness that is the custodian of our memory, it may be well for us to realize that over 90% of our every day activity is handled by our inner consciousness almost involuntarily without a conscious effort on our part. Every thought we have ever produced lies in our storehouse of memory, ideas awaiting our call. However, we need not always put forth a conscious effort to profit by such recall. Our consciousness automatically uses those stored thoughts to direct our physical action. Yes, I know, we don't always recall the facts we desire exactly when we desire them, but that doesn't mean that they are not there. It is that we are keeping our process of mind so busy just searching for memory that our inner consciousness has no way of getting the message through to us. How many times have you tried desperately to recall something and failed and have gone about your business doing other things only to discover that suddenly you remember clear and bright? There is only one process of mind and you have kept it so busy trying to remember that there wasn't an open line of communication. Thought is an expression of the creative intelligence as supplied to man, to every person, if only he will listen and receive and become conscious of the thoughts. The thoughts of the universe, of this earth at least, are here and crowding in upon us. All we need to do is listen. I have not seen too many years when I first recognized the bombardment of the creative thought of nature. It started when I was still a boy, honor with nature. I have always been a winner with nature. I used to like lying flat on my back in an old haystack out in the fields in spring. Once while doing just that and marveling at the formations of wild fowl overhead, a phenomenon many times greater than, and today I asked myself, what makes those geese, like swans, and cranes fly north in the spring of the year? They were guided by some unseen force, I determined, taken back to the place where they were born, the nesting place of the year, before and years before that, where they laid their eggs and produced them, and then in the fall, without road maps, they suddenly had heard some. They told them to fly south, so they left their home and flew to the southlands, where it would be warm and comfortable during the cold northern winter nights and days. With the awakening of my relationship with nature, and I have since cultivated every thought that I could recognize in my inner consciousness, or at least endeavor to do so, and put those thoughts into ideas. Man's educated consciousness becomes aware of that other side of man. 
privacy in our consciousness that is in constant touch with the creative intelligence, the director of nature. It is well to remember that every thought you produce tends to be given physical expression. Certainly, it will have an influence in the expression of your life. Man does not have the power to create thought. He becomes conscious of the creative thoughts and directs them in giving expression to his own activity. Through many of the thoughts man uses as a guide to the expression of life are the thoughts of others, for thoughts are no respecter of persons. Is thought limited by space? This world is blanketed with thoughts. The consciousness simply becomes aware of them and either accepts or rejects them. What we think we do. There are many different types of thought constructive, inventive, creative, optimistic, stimulative, and many other positive types. There are also negative types destructive, pessimistic, depressing, hateful, and so forth. One must choose carefully the thoughts he wishes to entertain. Remember, positive thoughts tend to bring much happiness to us and to others and to our pleasure of life, while negative thoughts tend to result in discord of vibrations that will deteriorate the body. When the body is no longer a fitting abode, the life force departs. Man brings destruction upon himself. Cooperative thoughts and forgiveness are neutralizers that will give man inner peace. Man must determine to live in harmony with nature. Life is what we think to make it. Every cell in the body is subjected to the impulse of thought. If your consciousness responds to such thought impulses and sends motivating energy to such muscles as are needed to carry out the demand of that thought, thus the thought is being transmuted into physical expression. Have you ever seen a face turn ashen gray from anger or a face flush crimson from embarrassment? Have you ever been frozen to a spot from fear? Of these physical reactions are due to thought, what you think you look, what you think you do, what you think you are. As a young man, I enjoyed athletics of all kinds, including boxing. One day, I was walking down the street with my mind on a thesis I was to write that weekend. I was so dubious of everything about me. At that moment, a fellow student, a very close friend, stepped in front of me and threw a fake punch at my jaw. There was no thought recognition, but a thought of defense. I struck back with deadly accuracy, and my friend was knocked off his feet. Worst of all, his head hit the sidewalk with such force that he suffered a HGHT fracture, the skull. Imagine my regret. At that moment, instinctive reactions evolved through my long training sessions, where boxing and stored in my inner consciousness had taken control of my body. Those defensive thoughts were transmuted into the physical, and my reaction was automatic. After reading the above facts concerning the transmutation of thought into the physical, you will recognize the need of thought control. Suppose someone did something that caused you to become angry. It, of course, is derivative of fear, and fear is one of man's most negative emotions. Those angry thoughts cause the inner consciousness to alert every cell in the body to contract and prepare for fight or flight. It may not be necessary to do either, but as long as the angry thought is controlling your actions, every cell in your body will feel the effect. Normal function has been interfered with, and it may take us for the body to repair the physical damage done by a single thought. On the other hand, the thought of friendliness can cause a sense of relaxation throughout the body and the relaxed body will function more normally. You will not only feel better, but look better. This thought transmutation into the physical is a confirmed fact. Think of the above illustration. Next time you find yourself becoming angered, what control, the word control, may strike you where it hurts. For few people have control of their thoughts. People are prone to produce selfish thoughts and then wonder why others disagree with them. Can you think of the other fellow's welfare some of the time? We truly believe that the success building power of the Shackley philosophy is due to the fact that we share our opportunities with the other fellow. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Men cannot make progress alone. Progress is the direct result of the service man renders to others. The greater the service rendered, the greater the progress. It all depends upon what you think. Thoughts, as you now know, have a tendency to be transmuted into the physical. The human being has been given dominion of 
for all things pertaining to his personal welfare. White court disaster by refusing to direct properly your production of thought. You must either produce your own directive thoughts or someone else will produce those thoughts for you. Are you acting upon the thoughts you have experienced in years past? Of course you are. 90% of your daily actions are motivated by thoughts experienced by you in days gone by. A thought is never lost, so guard against the cultivation of a thought that is not true to the type of you wish to live. Thought control is a necessary part of my life. I cannot express my life without thought, so why not control the type of thought my educated consciousness produces? The future life will be exactly what you think to make it, because every thought that has ever been produced by men or ever will be produced is here on this earth now, as I have stated earlier. We are blanketed by the vibrations of these thoughts. Success or failure is wholly dependent upon the thoughts man uses for the guidance of his activities. Man is endowed with the power of reason and given dominion over all things pertaining to his own well-being. That is why in everything you do, to use of thoughtsmanship. Thoughtsmanship, thoughtsmanship is an unfamiliar word to many who are reading this message. It is deeply embedded in the foundation of the Shackley philosophy. I coined the word thoughtsmanship many years ago as I believed it would more clearly describe the process of thoughtful planning. It is a word applied to the method is interrupting the expression of men's life or our lives. We all understand and are familiar with the meaning of such words as workmanship, hardship, salesmanship. These words express thoughts and activities which we have experienced at one time or another. Similarly, the thinker uses thoughtsmanship to direct his life's expression. What is thoughtsmanship? I assure you, it is not mysterious. On the contrary, it is as natural as life itself. While it includes principles of science, it is nevertheless down to earth and plainly understandable. Its teachings are simple. I intend to keep our discussion within the bounds of that simplicity. All great truths are simple truths. What I have to say in the following pages applies to you. It is also equally applicable to all men. From this moment on, if you will only so determine, can become an orderly, happy, successful existence, and thoughtsmanship, when you understand it, will lead to this existence. Thoughtsmanship is the art of expressing thoughts. It is a law of nature that man has to follow, whether he likes it or not. Every thought created in man's consciousness is expressed in the physical. It is a law of thought transmutation, which every impulse of thought is transmuted into every physical fiber of the body. Every conscious movement of the body requires thought direction, and every word spoken should be thoughtfully formed. In fact, thoughtsmanship is based upon your ability to receive as much as your ability to give do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Your future will be exactly what you think to make it. Your thoughts will soon guide you to new experiences, experiences anticipated and planned by you. Many new and bountiful things are in store for you. We use thoughtsmanship constantly from now on. It is the very beginning of human expression. It's the method used by all men to build life's pattern. It is my fond hope that I can help open many doors of understanding for all. Believe or not, you are constantly using thoughtsmanship in your struggle for existence. My point is simply this. If you learn to understand what you are doing, it need not be a discouraging struggle. In fact, it doesn't need to be a struggle at all. Why fight your way through life? Life is not your enemy. Life is a privilege. It is an enjoyable privilege if you choose to make it so. What you think, you look. What you think, you do what you think, you are. If you're going a single step further, let me explain it's how thoughtsmanship can be used every day of your life. We start well, at the beginning, of course. All things start with a thought, so start thinking creatively. Of something for which it is worth working. That something is means little at this point. It is a goal, it's a target at which you are aiming, and you will develop thoughts that will help you to reach that goal. 
If at first concentrating your thoughts upon a single goal proves to be difficult, you should not feel discouraged. Nothing is easy at the start. Still, you must keep your thoughts on your single purpose. Moreover, you can't produce just any old thought and try to kick yourself into believing that you are thinking creatively. Look at the value of the thoughts. You must think and think clearly about what it is you wish to accomplish, not think out a plan to follow. And keep those thoughts in mind. But those thoughts will guide your future action. There is an analogy between the successful thinker and the successful marksman. The marksman on the rifle range takes careful aim before firing the shot. He doesn't just fire at random, hoping he will hit something that will bring him the prize. His desire is to hit the bullseye. Therefore, he knows that his aim must be accurate. The same thing is true of the thoughtsman. Thinking at random will get him nowhere. He must aim his thoughts at a specific target. A person may never have fired a rifle at a target before, but he knows that the rifle must be carefully aimed in order to ring the bell. However, just aiming will never hit the target either. I've known many people who were good aimers. They were always aiming to do this, aiming to do that, but they never got around to firing the shot. Keep firing away without aiming at anything. They often hit something, but more times than not, they are unaware of the hit. In firing, the marksman knows that the rifle will never reach the target. It is only an instrument through which the bullet passes and by which the bullet is directed and sent on its way. So it is with our thoughts. We sight them at the goal we wish to reach, and our inner consciousness provides the energy to reach that goal. Life's expression will always conform to the thought pattern we produce. Allow that action to take place. Keep driving toward the goal. Choose the target carefully and load the rifle with thoughts that will make an impression. Our thoughts are our ammunition. Thoughtsmanship is the use we make of such ammunition. I paraphrase. Blessed are the straight thinkers, for they shall hit the bullseye. Thoughtsmanship will actually lead you into expression of a new life. You will produce thoughts in a more orderly and intelligent manner. You will demand and get what you want out of life and without enduring hardships incurred by careless thought. There are certain basic rules to be observed if you are to produce creative thought and reap the rewards of creative action. They are not difficult. Thousands of others are using thoughtsmanship in building their success, so proceed with confidence. Think things through completely. If it is something that can be corrected, do so at once. If it is something that can't be. Corrected or around it, but never worry about being unable to make a correction and never put off correcting something once you know you can. Worry is an attribute of fear and fear should never be tolerated. Fear is the greatest cause of failure. If you get into the habit of creating courageous thoughts, then the fear thoughts will be out, out of your life. When you are not thinking about trouble, it doesn't exist as far as you are concerned. To the student of thoughtsmanship, who will soon become a thing of the past, will simply refuse to produce worry thought. This doesn't mean that he will not be concerned over certain occurrences. He will, but the concern will cause him to develop thoughts toward positive remedial action, and this will eliminate all worry at the source. Today, life may seem appallingly confusing to you, but it is not. You may have worked your way into a complicated position, but if you try, you can think your way out of it. The greater the complication, the greater the need for creative thought, that's all. Thought changes things big and small. At first, the very idea of having to think for yourself may be frightening. You have been so dependent on the other fellow's judgment that you have little confidence in your own ability to think things through to a solution. You fear the responsibility incurred by taking a clear and definite stand on any subject. You are not alone. Others are also afraid to assume responsibility. The interesting element here is that this can give you an advantage. Through thoughtsmanship, you know that your creative thoughts will be transmuted into physical expression, but within your inner consciousness resides all the power necessary to create the desired conditions. 
you are not going to let someone else direct your life for you, especially since that someone else is quite likely to be acting out of fear, and his direction may easily be very much in error. And two, he may be driven by a selfish motive, looking out for himself. Stop passing the book to someone else. Take over the reins. You are responsible for the expression of your life, so why not direct that life in such a way that the profit goes into your life account? This is getting quite personal, isn't it? It's intended to be. Life will be just what you think to make it. Your thoughts are your own responsibility. You produce them in your own thought factory, and you are the production manager. Preparation and hold to those thoughts. Think things through. Build a complete thought pattern. Your inner consciousness must be convinced that you are determined. Once you have changed your manner of thinking from wishful or idle thinking to earnest, conscientious, creative thinking, your inner consciousness will be fully aware of your determination. The expression of those thoughts in the physical is assured. Don't expect miracles from your inner consciousness. Once you have made a demand upon it through the production of creative thought, you must be prepared to hang until you have accomplished your purpose. Don't expect to plant the seed one day and reap the harvest the next. Maybe it is possible for the inner consciousness to produce the desired result the next day, but are you prepared to be used in giving it expression? Yes, used. For you, like the rifle, but the instrument through which expression is passed. Remember the means of communication between man and his inner consciousness is through his process of mind. He develops a thought and it is deposited in his memory files where it is acted upon by his inner consciousness. Every thought is a seed sown in fertile soil. Your harvest will be in exact proportion to the care given the plant that springs from that seed. You can cultivate and nurture it or you can neglect it and let it wither and die. How many wonderful, potentially profitable plants have you created only to allow neglect to destroy them? If you indulge in careless, wishful thinking, you will express a careless, disorganized life. You are the ruling master over your process of mind. You have an intelligence with which to control your thoughts, so you must direct the production of creative thoughts. A man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Having successfully applied thoughtsmanship in my own life for more years than I care to admit, I can readily reveal that the facts I am presenting are largely a reflection of my own experiences. The whole framework of thoughtsmanship is constructed of material taken from knowledge gained through its actual operation, doing living. I can assure you, thoughtsmanship works. It has built the most successful life for me. It has brought me health, happiness, and prosperity. I have seen it work for others, two friends, and members of my own family. To build a healthy, happy, and prosperous life, a man must carefully build a healthy, happy, and purposeful thought pattern, a pattern he can live by. Remember, every thought created has a tendency to be transmuted into the physical. You cannot escape the effect of your thoughts, good or bad. Little by little, they are forming the shape of your future life. Too idealistic. But on your life, it is your life. Are you becoming conscious of your own thought power? What you think you look, what you think you do, what you think you are. Your thoughts will absolutely direct your success or failure. I am not speaking of good or evil, but rather of the intelligence you use in directing your life force. I have always looked upon evil as backward living. Try spelling live backwards and see what I mean. Bossmanship is going to do away with any tendency you may have toward backward living. You are going to live a planned life, a life in which you know where you are going and how to get there. Never hold a thought on anything you do not want to happen. Stop thinking yourself into failure, but start thinking of the success you know you can be. Bossmanship is then the beginning of human expression of inner consciousness, the birthplace of success. The birthplace of success, the birthplace of success, is in your inner consciousness, but you must plant the thought seed. Inner consciousness is no respecter of person. Plant the seeds of failure, and failure will be expressed. Plant the seeds of success, and success is assured. All of the facts presented thus far have been given to you for the purpose of harmonizing your thoughts with life's success plan. 
that the birthplace of success is in our inner consciousness. You also know that the surest road to success is through the application of thoughtsmanship. In this message, I will set before you the truths concerning the key to success. That key will open the door to success. I cannot give you that success, for that is beyond my power. Everyone must earn it himself, but I can give you a thorough understanding of thoughtsmanship and through that knowledge and its application to life, there is nothing to prevent you. From becoming the success you have always longed to be, you stand at the doorway of life's treasure vaults. Those treasures are yours for the taking. Don't stand outside looking in. Just wishing yourself inside will afford you nothing. Wishful thinking will get you nowhere. You must determine to use thoughtsmanship in building your success. Success is not made up of what you hope for. To build a healthy, happy, and prosperous life, a man must carefully build a healthy, happy, and purposeful thought pattern, a pattern he can live by. Remember, every thought created has a tendency to be transmuted to the physical. You cannot escape the effect of your thoughts, good or bad. For little by little, they are forming the shape of your future life. Too idealistic, not on your life. It is your life. Are you becoming conscious of your own thought power? What do you think you look? What do you think you do? What do you think you are? Your thoughts will absolutely direct your success or failure. I am not speaking of good or evil, but rather of the intelligence you use in directing your life force. I have always looked upon evil as backwards living. Try spelling live backwards and see what I mean. Bossmanship is going to do away with any tendency you may have toward backward living. You are going to live a planned life, a life in which you know where you're going and how to get there. Never hold a thought on anything you do not want to happen. Stop thinking yourself into failure. Start thinking of the success you know you can be. Thoughtsmanship is then the beginning of human expression of inner consciousness, the birthplace of success. In the birthplace of success, the birthplace of success is in your inner consciousness, but you must plant the thought seed. Inner consciousness is no respecter of person. Plant the seeds of failure and failure will be expressed. Plant the seeds of success and success is assured. All the facts presented thus far have been given to you for the purpose of harmonizing your thoughts with life's success plan. You know that the birthplace of success is in our inner consciousness. You also know that the surest road to success is through the application of thoughtsmanship. In this message, I will set before you the truths concerning the key to success. That key will open the door to success. I cannot give you that success, for that is beyond my power. Everyone must earn it himself. I can give you a thorough understanding of thoughtsmanship and through that knowledge and its application to life. There is nothing to prevent you from becoming the success you have always longed to be. You stand at the doorway of life's treasure vaults. Those treasures are yours for the taking. Don't stand outside looking in. Just wishing yourself inside will afford you nothing. Wishful thinking will get you nowhere. You must determine to use thoughtsmanship in building your success. Success is not made up of what you hope for, but of what you create. The price of success is just one thought after another. If you indulge in careless, wishful thinking, you will express a careless, disorganized life. What you think, you look. What you think, you do. What you think, you are. You have an intelligence with which to control your thoughts, and you are the ruling master over the process of mind, so you must direct the production of creative thoughts. Of course, you are dependent upon your inner consciousness for the expression of life, but you direct that life expression. We're going to continue looking for and taking advantage of every break. Don't. To do so would be dependent upon chance. Don't just let things happen to happen. Make them happen. Life may be influenced by chance if we allow it, but it need not be so affected. There is no need to gamble with our future life. Gambling in any form is non productive. Gambling is a product of wishful thinking and cannot be transmuted into productive physical expression. 
If you are a gambler, you are not directing your process of mind. Success is just one thought after another. If you indulge in careless, wishful thinking, you will express a careless, disorganized life. What you think, you look. What you think, you do. What you think, you are. You have an intelligence with which to control your thoughts, and you are the ruling master over the process of mind. So you must direct the production of creative thought. Of course, you are dependent upon your inner consciousness for the expression of life, but you direct that life expression. Are you going to continue looking for and taking advantage of every great point? To do so would be dependent upon chance. Don't just let things happen to happen, they can happen. Life may be influenced by chance if we allow it, but it need not be so affected. There is no need to gamble with our future life. Gambling in any form is non productive. Gambling is a product of wishful thinking and cannot be transmuted into productive physical expression. If you are a gambler, you are not directing your process of mind in the production of creative thought. You are staking your future on the turn of the card. You become a mere puppet of fate with all the disappointments of such a fate awaiting you. Your business, your home life, and your very existence must suffer from such a fate. There is no surer way to failure than over such a road. No, it is a common theory that is a gamble, that nothing ventured, nothing gained. But there is a great deal of difference between a venture and a gamble. A venture in busyness is similar to a carefully laid plan. It may be a risky one, but it should be one in which the possibility of loss has been weighed against possible profits and in which the individual involved has proceeded according to plan. When a venture goes beyond a carefully laid plan, it becomes a gamble. Life is a venture and should be planned with utmost care. Thoughts are required to construct a plan, so the process of mind should be used in the production of creative thoughts. To allow your venture in life to go beyond your carefully constructed plan and become a gamble is to acknowledge your weaknesses. You are either ignorant of the necessity of such a plan or just plain lazy. Harsh words, but true ones. Direct your imagination. That is just one thought after another. If you indulge in careless, wishful thinking, you will express a careless, disorganized life. What you think, you look. What you think, you do. That is just one thought after another. If you indulge in careless, wishful thinking, you will express a careless, disorganized life. What you think, you look. What you think, you do. What you think, you are. You have an intelligence with which to control your thoughts, and you are the ruling master over the process of mind, so you must direct the production of creative thoughts. Of course, you are dependent upon your inner consciousness for the expression of life, but you direct that life expression. Are you going to continue looking for and taking advantage of every great point? To do so would be dependent upon chance. Don't just let things happen to happen, make them happen. Life may be influenced by chance if we allow it, but it need not be so affected. There is no need to gamble with our future life. Gambling in any form is non productive. Gambling is a product of wishful thinking and cannot be transmuted into productive physical expression. If you are a gambler, you are not directing your process of mind in the production of creative thought. You are staking your future on the turn of a card. You become a mere puppet of fate with all the disappointments of such a fate awaiting you. Your business, your home life, and your very existence must suffer from such a fate. There is no sure way to failure over such a road. 
So it is a common theory that is a gamble that nothing ventured, nothing gained, but there is a great deal of difference between a venture and a gamble. A venture in busyness is similar to a carefully laid plan. It may be a risky one, but it should be one in which the possibility of loss has been weighed against possible profits and in which the individual involved has proceeded according to plan. When a venture goes beyond a carefully laid plan, it becomes a gamble. Life is a venture and should be planned with utmost care. Thoughts are required to construct a plan, so the process of mind should be used in the production of creative thoughts. To allow your venture in life to go beyond your carefully constructed plan and become a gamble is to acknowledge your weaknesses. If you are either ignorant of the necessity of such a plan, or just plain lazy. Harsh words, but true ones. Direct your imagination and build a thought pattern, a plan that may later become a reality. You may produce a plan through the power of your imagination that is complete in every detail and with assurance it will seek expression in your life. And in its preparation, and hold to those thoughts, you must convince the inner consciousness of your determination. Once you have changed your manner of thinking from wishful, idle thinking to earnest, conscientious, creative thinking, your inner consciousness will be fully aware of your determination, and the expression of those thoughts in the physical is assured. Give as much care to the thought products of the imagination as you would to the products of a dynamite factory, for they are just as powerful and just as dangerous. The production of one faulty image may ruin a man's future. And imagine a thing you do not want to happen for those thoughts to act as a funnel through which life will be expressed. Our lives are directed by the thoughts we produce, so we must direct our thoughts at all times, not just in emergencies. What you think, you look. What you think, you do. What you think, you are. What is processed in the brain, after that thought is in the custody of your inner consciousness, filed away in the storehouse of memory. Memory is too valuable to be left in the care of your educated consciousness. You can, however, call upon your inner consciousness for a reproduction of those thoughts. In such instances, the brain cells are then used to reproduce the thought. We call this the act of remembering. Of course, if you constantly tell your inner consciousness that you have a poor memory and just can't remember anything, you will get exactly what you are asking for a poor memory. Every thought is a prayer. They have produced many false thoughts as readily perceived, but it is not the fault of your brain. You must take the blame for such errors. Remember, those thoughts will remain as a permanent record and will influence your inner consciousness in giving expression to your future life as man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Following the thoughtsmanship plan may necessitate many changes in your life, but I assure you the results will be with effort. It's worth the effort, but no greater than the effort. We get out of life exactly what we put into our inner consciousness, the birthplace of success. Time is always an element you must take into consideration in fulfillment of your desires. Things just don't happen overnight. It takes time for you to prepare yourself as the instrument through which your desires can be expressed. As we have previously stated, the means of communication the educated consciousness and our inner consciousness is through our process of mind. We receive a thought and it is deposited in our memory files where it is acted upon by our inner consciousness. Every thought is a seed sown in fertile soil. The harvest yield is up to us. We reap the benefits in life. You are now a student of thoughtsmanship, so you ought to think, speak, and act like the success you soon will be. To be a success, you must be success minded. Your thoughts will be transmuted into physical expression, and you will soon find yourself on the way up. Keep that image ever before the inner consciousness and expect action. You must see yourself on the way up. up. Expect to win. The expectation will set a pattern for your accomplishment. There is an old familiar phrase that states, nothing seems like success, and how true it is. It is easy for the successful man to think of success. Why should he harbor the thoughts of failure? He is a success and thinks like one. Who attracts the larger circle of friends, the successful men or the failure? True friends may be only fairweather friends, but they are attracted by what the successful man has been able to accomplish. Is such an attraction due to his physical possessions alone? Most people
people are, of course, envious of another man's wealth. So maybe there's something else that attracts. From my knowledge of thoughtsmanship, I know the attracting element is something else. Our greatest power of attraction is due to the thoughts we broadcast. As our thoughts are broadcast and may be received by the inner consciousness of others, how many times have you been sitting quietly in the presence of a friend when without warnings both of you speak the same words, which one was expressing the thoughts of the other? Have you ever found yourself taking on the mannerisms and actually expressing yourself exactly the same way as someone with whom you have been closely associated, whose thoughts are directing those actions? Yes, we are affected by the thoughts of others, and our thoughts affect them. Thoughts are things that are broadcast pretty much as are the messages of television or radio. Our thoughts travel far and near. Space is no barrier to thought. Thoughtsmanship leads us into an expression of a new. If we will produce thought in a more orderly, intelligent manner. We will demand and get what we want out of life. Your inner consciousness has access to the universal storehouse of knowledge. It frequently uses you to express that knowledge. Give it a chance. Give it freedom. Allow this inner consciousness to influence your life. Whatsoever you ask, believing, shall be given to you. The proper application of thoughtsmanship requires the proper use of your process of mind. You want and you literally need to express a successful life. You search for prosperity, but you aren't sure how to get it. You search for new ideas, but you don't quite know what to do with them when they arrive. This disturbs you somewhat, but you need not be concerned. The abilities you possess far exceed any expression of life you've ever demanded of yourself thus far. Limitations exist, yes, but they are certainly not controlled by past experiences. All things must start with a thought, so start thinking creatively. It isn't wise, of course, to try to accomplish anything until you know what it is you are trying to accomplish. Think of something, anything that is worth working for. What the goal may be is not as important at this time as the fact that you are going to create thought that will allow you to realize that goal. Later you can set a higher goal. You will soon find that once you have been able to plan and reach a certain goal, it is much easier to plan for and reach the next one. With the satisfaction derived from attaining a goal, individual confidence increases and becomes ever more daring in setting a more difficult goal for the future. As confidence and faith in yourself increases, your progress also increases. Whatever and wherever the goal may be, you can reach it if you have definitely planned your work and know before you start just how you are going to accomplish your purpose. No thinking of success produce the kind of successful life you desire. No, not any more than thinking about eating your dinner will place the meal on your plate. Thought must be given to the preparation of the meal, plus the expenditure of energy to prepare it before you can benefit from the nutritional values. Just thinking about the meal isn't enough. Just thinking about success isn't going to produce an intelligent, comprehensive thought pattern through which your inner consciousness can achieve that success either. This doesn't discount the possibility that your inner consciousness as it may borrow from the thoughts of others and surprise you. If you had it, you may even get greater accomplishment than you requested. This happens quite often, but the thoughtsman prefers to work out his own patterns to success. You have begun to make progress in the art of thoughtsmanship. If you wish, you can put into operation laws and principles which will materialize your cherished aims. Will you do it? Will you use the knowledge you have gained? Will you make fine resolutions and fail to carry them out? The choice should be an easy one. It is no more difficult to do things successfully than it is to do the things that lead to failure, except that the competition may be pushing you toward failure. The necessary effort will not be in the doing, but in the thinking. Once you produce the directing thought, you will find that the expression is easy. I have always found that the mind is pretty much like a wheelbarrow that goes the way it is pushed. Who is pushing your mind around? What decisions have you made today? What definite plans have you prepared? If you have failed to make the decision today, you have postponed for another day the accomplishment of the thing that you desire. What matters if your decision is in error? 
the day was lost anyway. You failed to make any decision. The world will not condemn you for making the wrong decision, but it will condemn you for indecision. If you have made the wrong decision, you have at least gained an experience, but if you make no decision at all, you have gained nothing. The habit of procrastination simply shunts you onto the side track where you rest from an activity. Indecision is one sure way to failure. Whatever the problem confronting you, you have to think it out and come to a definite determination. Choose and start. It is impossible to get anywhere without a start. Every accomplishment, someone has to make a decision. Every moment of your life, you are selling yourself to someone, so you should decide not to sell the best that is in you. Decide to make that step forward, then dig in. Add a toe hold and be ready for the next step. Each step gives exercise to the muscles of progress. Exercise comes greater strength. If you want success, you must expect it. Determination to accomplish your purpose. The sailing vessel is enabled to make progress directly against the breeze. Before it sets the sails determinately and goes in a zigzag. Course, your direct progress may also be blocked. You are confronted with the inevitable, so you too must change your course and go around. Determination and expectation will find a way around. Set the sails to take advantage of the winds of adversity. If a goal is worth fighting for, it is worth possessing. You must ask yourself what is it that you desire most from life, wealth, influence, or power? Do you desire wisdom so that you may win fame? Do you think that through you can? Punishment of such an undertaking, you will have all that you desire of life. If so, you are overlooking your greatest possession, love and respect of those around you. The greatest treasure man can possess in this life is to love and be loved. Nothing can so fill the soul as the expression of love. With the expression of love of someone, we are able to forget self. We have only to bring happiness to that other person. Without the other person, all of our other possessions become but empty dreams, meaningless in themselves. Love, man's greatest emotion, is the birthplace of happiness. He knows only self-giving, yet with the giving it remains with the giver. Truly, it is more blessed to give love than to receive it. There can be no true happiness in life without it. Love inspires man to greater accomplishment. It lends purpose to life. Love is a sure foundation upon which to build the future. Remember, thoughtsmanship applies to all walks of life, your home life, your social life, and your business life. Your health, happiness, and prosperity are dependent upon the use you make of thoughtsmanship, so be in preparation of a thought pattern that will direct the expression of a well-rounded, successful life. Apply this knowledge of thoughtsmanship to everyday life. We are selling our thoughts to our loved ones, our friends, our business associates, and all those about us. Such thoughts as will bring a pleasing profit. Thought builds personality. For what you think you are. What you are speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. Thoughts, countenances, actions, all shout our worth to the other fellow. So, when you speak, you must give thought to what you say. Establish a concordant personality in your home, so that as a couple, as a family, you can think as one. The concordant personality that makes the home atmosphere I mean real home feeling. Did you ever go into a home that just vibrated with happiness? You knew it was a real home. Yes, we feel that. The vibrations of others. And two, when you create a concordant personality in your home, you are building the foundation of your success. If one of the things you wish to acquire in life is the friendship of a certain person, you have to become interested in them. You have to stop thinking of yourself. Thoughts of self will not attract the other person. Keep the process of mind busy, producing friendly thoughts as emotions. friendly and express that friendly feeling. It may prove surprising how much friendship influences success of life. Anyone 
and who masters thoughtsmanship should have no trouble with friendship. The thought you produce will act as a magnet, attracting friendship as surely as the magnet attracts steel. You are literally what you think a friend. Try to fool others. You may believe that you can keep your thoughts a secret, but it is astonishing how quickly those secret thoughts are transmuted into a physical expression. Facial expressions, if nothing else, reveal your thoughts. What you think, you look. Your character today is the sum total of the thoughts you have produced in days past. Your thoughts have created your habits, and your habits have induced the circumstances you now endure. Do you want to change your character, your habits, or your circumstances? Then you must alter your thoughts, and you will soon alter your f You must start producing the thoughts that will build the kind of life you most desire. What you think, you do tell me what your habits are, and I will tell you what your thoughts have been. There's no magic to this. Habits are the effect of past thoughts. Thoughts are stored in the storehouse of memory, inner consciousness, and inner consciousness acts upon those thoughts. Expressing them a few times is the beginning of a habit or bed, so it is of vital importance for you to carefully direct your manner of expression. Habits are so easily formed and so hard to break. If you wish to change your habits, you must first change your thoughts. It's that simple. Habits don't just happen to happen. We make them happen. We create them by the repeated production of thought. The more often a thought is produced, the stronger the habit. And since we are creatures of habit, we should willfully produce thoughts that will form good ones and support them. With determined thoughts of success, you cannot be wrathful or capricious and expect to gain the cooperation of others. Your purpose and motive must be to perfect your service to your fellow man. You are guided by immutable laws, the laws of nature, and you are a part of the creative plan. Claim your inheritance, it is yours for the thinking. Through the production of creative thought, you will be able to achieve your purpose in life. You have the power, you need only to direct it. It is not a question of developing the power within. You have, no doubt, many times the amount of power needed or used. It is only a matter of developing your ability to use it. What demands are you making upon the power? Are you asking for pennies or possibly nickels and dimes when you should be asking for dollars? Do you consider this a show of humble servants by asking for the crumbs of happiness that fall from the table of others when you should be asking for a full course? Dinner. You must get in there and fight for what you want. It's yours for the thinking. It will not be handed to you on a silver platter. You must earn your way, and by earning your way, I mean that you must think your way through life. Thoughts produce action, and only through action can you attain that which is worthwhile. The world doesn't owe you a living. You ought to earn that. You are endowed with a portion of the creative energy, but you must intelligently direct it. If another fellow has outstripped you in the race for fame and fortune, it is because he has more intelligently directed his inner powers. He has no greater powers than you have. Whether he is young or old matters little. Creative powers do not diminish with the years. You may start at any age creating the type of life you want to live. It is all in the way you think about it. Your happiness and prosperity await you through direction. You allowing age to slow you down. It may affect the physical body, but it need not affect the power of thought. Usually it is the neglect of power production that causes the physical body to weaken. Too many expect their age to affect their bodies. Ambition fades because they think they are too old to undertake any new endeavor. They have lost their desire to accomplish. It's surprising how much physical strength can be produced if you expect your body to do so. Yes, you say, I see a lot of opportunities, but I am too old to take the advantage of them now. That was not true of the great men of history. It is not so much a question of years as it is a question of what we think about age. History proves that the greatest accomplishments throughout the world have been from then past the half century mark. That fact should be a source of encouragement to those of mature years, but it need not be a deterrent to those of younger years. 
Of course, you expect to accomplish a great deal when you are older, but you need not wait for the years to roll by. Establish a goal and then think out a plan along which to proceed. Come to a decision today and start doing things. You can never allow fear of a poor start to hold you back. Any kind of a start is better than standing still. Whatever your mistakes may be, they prove a willingness to try. While you are standing still, the world rushes on. Others are accomplishing the things you might have accomplished or might still accomplish. An automobile doesn't get a person anywhere until he starts the motor, turns on the power, depresses the accelerator. And the power plant man must express action before the other power plant, the auto, will express action, and therefore, before any progress can be made. vibrations of others. And two, when you create a concordant personality in your home, you are building the foundation of your success. If one of the things you wish to acquire in life is the friendship of a certain person, you have to become interested in him. You have to stop thinking of yourself. Thoughts of self will not attract the other person. Keep the process of mind busy, producing friendly thoughts, arouse emotions. Feel friendly and express that friendly feeling. It may prove surprising how much friendship influences success of life. Anyone who masters thoughts friendship should have no trouble with friendship. The thought you produce will act as a magnet, attracting friendship as surely as the magnet attracts steel. You are literally what you think a friend. Never try to fool others. You may believe that you can keep your thoughts a secret, but it is astonishing how those secret thoughts are transmuted into physical expression. Facial expressions, if nothing else, reveal your thoughts. What you think, you look. Your character today is the sum total of the thoughts you have produced in days past. Your thoughts have created your habits, and your habits have induced the circumstances you now endure. Do you want to change your character, your habits, or your circumstances? Then you must alter your thoughts, and you will soon alter your you must start producing the thoughts that will build the kind of life you most desire. What you think, you do tell me what your habits are, and I will tell you what your thoughts have been. There's no magic to this. Habits are the effect of past thoughts. Thoughts are stored in the storehouse of memory, inner consciousness, and inner consciousness acts upon those thoughts. Hopefully expressing them a few times is the beginning of a habit, good or bad. So it is of vital importance for you to carefully direct your manner of expression. Habits are so easily formed and so hard to break. If you wish to change your habits, you must first change your thoughts. It's that simple. Habits don't just happen to happen. We make them happen. We create them by the repeated production of thought. The more often a thought is produced, the stronger the habit. And since we are creatures of habit, we should willfully produce thoughts that will form good ones and support them. With determined thoughts of success, you cannot be wrathful or capricious and expect to gain the cooperation of others. Your purpose and motive must be to perfect your service to your fellow man. You are guided by the immutable laws, the laws of nature, and you are part of the creative plan. Claim your inheritance it is yours for the thinking. Through the production of creative thought, be able to achieve your purpose in life. You have the power, you need only to direct it. It is not a question of developing the power within. You have, no doubt, many times the amount of power you are used. It is only a matter of developing your ability to use it. What demands are you making upon the power? Are you asking for pennies or possibly nickels and times when you should be asking for dollars? Do you consider this a show of humble reverence by asking for the crumbs of happiness that fall from the table of others when you should be asking for a full course? Tinder must get in there, fight for what you want. It's used for the thinking. It will not be handed to you on a silver platter. You must earn your way, and by earning your way, I mean that you must think your way through life. 
thoughts produce action, and only through action can you attain that which is worthwhile. The world doesn't owe you a living. You've got to earn that. You are endowed with a portion of the creative energy, but you must intelligently direct it. If another fellow has outstripped you in the race for fame and fortune, it is because he has more intelligently directed his inner powers. He has no greater powers than you have. Whether he is young or old matters little. Your creative powers do not diminish with the years. You may start at any age creating the type of life you want to live. It is all in the way you think about it. Your happiness and prosperity awaits you through direction. By you allowing age to slow you down. Age may affect the physical body, but it need not affect the power of thought. Usually, it is the neglect of power production that causes the physical body to weaken. Too many expect their age to affect their bodies. Ambition fades because they think they are too old to undertake any new endeavor. They have lost their desire to accomplish. It is surprising how much physical strength can be produced if you expect your body to do so. If you say, I see a lot of opportunities, but I am too old to take advantage of them now. That was not true of the great men of history. Age is not so much a question of years as it is a question of what we think about age. History proves that the greatest accomplishments throughout the world have been from men past the half century mark. That fact should be a source of encouragement to those of mature years, but it need not be a deterrent to those of younger years. Of course, you expect to accomplish a great deal when you are older, but you need not wait for the years to roll by. Establish a goal and then think out a plan on which to proceed. Come to a decision today and start doing things. You can never allow fear of a poor start to hold you back. Any kind of a start is better than standing still. Whatever your mistakes may be, they prove a willingness to try. While you are standing still, the world rushes on and others are accomplishing the things you might have accomplished or might still accomplish. An automobile doesn't get a person anywhere until he starts the motor, turns on the power, depresses the accelerator. One power plant man must express action before the other power plant auto will express action, and therefore, before any progress can be made. As with everything else we do thinking, two falls into habit patterns. Not only do we get into the habit of thinking along certain lines, but we develop the habit of thinking certain types of thought. The habit of producing creative thought is just as easily formed as the habit of producing wishful thought. Active thinking requires no more energy for expression than does passive thinking. You know that you are producing active thoughts by taking time to think things out to bring your thoughts to some final conclusion. People judge you by what you have done, not by what you expect to do. There's an old phrase that can be paraphrased, the road to failure is paved with good intentions. Of course, you must have good intentions. You must expect the better things in life, but you must build your thought pattern as a guide to the development of such things. The steps to your goal must be clearly outlined. You dare not slack off. What would you think of an oarsman who started to row his boat upstream, then suddenly stopped rowing and began paddling around in circles? The current would soon carry him back to his starting point, perhaps even beyond it. He might make another start, of course, but to what avail? As long as he continued the bad habit of easing off slash, he would soon get nowhere. Plan for the future, but do not waste the present. Take out of this moment every bit of joy that it affords. Refuse to allow thought that will cause a moment of unpleasantness. Never allow the manna have to ruin your life. You can be sure of only this one moment, so make the most of it. Today is actually, but tomorrow can be only theoretical. If you have developed a habit of refusing to live this day, there may be hundreds, yes, even thousands of jokes wasted. Build a habit of careful thought. Prove to your friends and neighbors that your statements are backed by sound judgment. Acquire the habit of weighing your words and actions carefully. If you do this, you will soon lose the habit of criticism and idle gossip. Whatsoever you ask, believing shall be given unto you. Perhaps you only half-heartedly believe that and decide to put it to the test. Of course, you don't really expect it to work, but you're willing to tell your inner consciousness what you would like to accomplish in the weeks that are to come. Your 
repeat a certain statement in fashion for a few days and then sit back and wait to see what happens. Of course, nothing happens. Or if something does happen, it is opposed to your plan. Just what was wrong with the test you made. The same thing that is wrong with the procedure of most of those hoping to find the secret of mental control of life. It just won't work. Reading or repeating a phrase every hour in the day is not sufficient to arouse action on the part of your inner consciousness. There are millions, yes, even billions, of wishful thoughts produced in your process of mind. Many of them are acted upon by your inner consciousness. Why? Because you lack faith in your own mental process. You have failed to impress your inner consciousness with your desire for action. You get out of your life, your innermost being, exactly what you put into it. After you have made the above test and found that it doesn't work, and someone asks you if you expected it to work, you will probably answer something this well I didn't actually expect it, no, but I was wishing it would. You had asked but hadn't the proper expectations. Nothing can be accomplished by wishful thinking. You must ask believing carrot and your expectations will be a guide to your inner powers. Expect failure and failure will come. There will be no positive success thoughts to be transmuted into physical expression. In other words, you get what you ask for. If you are to derive any benefit from this message, you must recognize the truths herein contained and have faith in your inner consciousness to direct your life according to the plan you produce in your thoughts. Fleeting thoughts will not do. You must plant determined thoughts in your inner consciousness and hold them there until they are given physical expression. There is nothing mysterious about it, just a simple law of cause and effect. Our inner consciousness is the greatest advertising sales agency on earth. Our thoughts are advertised and sold in the open market. For what you think, you look, what you think, you do. What you think, you are. How much are you worth on the open market? What value does the world place upon you? Just what do you think of yourself? Self-valuation is a very important thing. Your worth to the world is the value you place upon yourself. Others accept you at that value. Not the bluff value you try to exhibit, but the true value you place through your process of mind. Cultivate those values. Produce thoughts that will give your value expression. Determine your own values. Values are determined by the thoughts you produce concerning them. It is not what a thing is worth, but what it is worth to you. That is true of any task you have to perform. It is difficult only if you believe it to be so. If you consider it beyond your ability of accomplishment, it of course will be. That which makes it appear difficult may be only a disagreeable feature, a thing in which you may not care to indulge. Remember that old slogan. The difficult things we do immediately, impossible takes a little longer. Some say we have the opportunities that others have to gain success. Oh, but we all have. Opportunity never comes knocking at the door. It never seeks entrance. It never comes from without. Opportunity is of our own creation. Too much has been said about opportunity, knocking but once. Unfortunate indeed is the person who believes that opportunity has passed him by. Opportunity is created only within our own process of mind. It is ever present in our inner consciousness, waiting for us to call it forth. You too may create such opportunities. Build your plan of solid constructive success thoughts. Never produce a single thought of failure. To do so will weaken your whole structure. Your thoughts are guiding your expression of no one can force you into failure except yourself. The success you were once so proud of has crumbled. You may be sure that some of the foundation stones were failure thoughts. Remember, never think a thing that you do not want to happen. It is said that our life is made up of a chain of circumstances. Those circumstances are of our own making, for the links of the chain are forged by our thoughts. Let there be a group of weak thoughts, and we have a weak link in the chain. We determine by our thoughts whether the chain is strong or weak. Every thought, regardless of its nature, influences our life. We have dominion over our process of mind. We can develop the type of thought we wish to develop. Those thoughts are our own. One can force us to think a weak spot into our chain of life unless we allow them to do so. Of course, thoughts that are produced by others are recorded in our storehouse of memory. 
anyone can force you to be a success. Neither can anyone force you to be a failure. Either a success or a failure according to the thoughts you produce, or there will be no expression of either without thought direction. You can accomplish as much or as little as you think you can. Success is yours for the acting. A man is never a fail until he acts like one. He may be low on finances, but he is never broke as long as his process of mind produces thought that can be sold at a profit. He desires health, happiness, and prosperity, and he must claim them, for they are his birthright. He must claim them through positive thought and action. Within your inner consciousness, he has the power to make of yourself the success you long to be. Why not allow it to give expression to success building thoughts? Never become discouraged simply because you have failed to reach your goal. Instead, search deep within yourself for the cause of such failure. You either decided upon a course of action that was not conducive to success, or else you made the start if you were prepared to carry out your decision. Make the decision and then put forth the effort necessary to prepare for the task. Plant the thought deep in your inner consciousness, and each day cultivate that thought with added reasons why it is desired. Inner consciousness will soon begin the transmutation of those thoughts into physical expression, and you will find that ways and means are presenting themselves for development along the lines so necessary for the success of your adventure. The above statement is not upon wishful thinking but has been proven many times in my own life as well as in the lives of others. There is nothing to be accomplished through wishful thinking. You must develop the habit of determined thought. Don't think for one moment that my life has been easy. There have been many discouraging moments and I have been given the same discouraging advice that everyone has received at one time or another from friends and relatives. Free advice is cheap and that is about the only value that can be placed on it. Information supplied at an individual's request is a different thing. You may at times be able to derive a great deal of information from the advice of others, but we must carefully screen it. Had I listened to the advice of some well-meaning friends and relatives, I would never have been able to write this message for my experiences in life would not have warranted. Endeavor. I have spent many years in study and research, and some of those years were rather lean ones, but I have had a good time. I have enjoyed my life, for I was doing that which I enjoyed doing. I am not what some might consider a wealthy man, yet I know that I am among the richest men in the world. A small portion of my wealth is represented by my bank account. My real wealth is deposited in my storehouse of memory, and no one can take that away from me. My thoughts were sold to others for a price, yet they still belong to me, and I'm earning a good rate of interest. In our journeys through life, we all meet or know too many who are willing to offer discouraging advice. They may be friends, chance acquaintances, or even close relatives. Don't listen to them. I don't mean that a person should never take advice. Far from it, but he must consider such advice as coming from a person with a different personality than his own. His would-be advisor might fail utterly in a certain task, whether with a more favorable personality and determination might succeed. Seek always to gain experience through the experiences of others and then use such experiences to prepare yourself better for the vocation of your choice. Through analysis, the weaknesses of others will be displayed. The experiences of others will clearly point out those weaknesses, and you can avoid making the same mistakes. Do not be too severe of those offering criticism of an effort. Analyze the cause of such criticism carefully. A weakness in a plan may thereby be overcome. Not all criticism is unfriendly. And two, a critic may at some future date be in a position to give comfort or grief in a chosen field of endeavor. How much better it is at such times to know that he has a friendly interest in you. Of my most severe critics during my early life eventually became staunch supporters of my work. If we get into the habit of ignoring criticism altogether, we are quite likely to continue nursing our faults. Faults should be as readily recognized as virtues and should be quickly eliminated from our nature. Our thoughts are being sold to all those who know us. It's two o'clock. He wants to advertise and sell his faults to his I am sure none of us do, yet 
That is exactly what we are doing every day of our lives if we fail to overcome our faults. Sell the prophet, your intolerance, suspicion, and jealousy. No one admires a conceited attitude nor a desire to get even. Seek revenge upon another fellow. People get no pleasure from such acts. Therefore, you must eliminate such thoughts from your process of mind. Selling such thoughts will prevent you from reaching your desired goals. There is no such thing as a secret thought. That which you believe to be secret is broadcast to the world and will greatly influence your degree of success. What you think, you look, and what you think is felt by others. Cultivate your imagination and then sell your thoughts at the profit. The profit will be entirely dependent upon your individual effort as far as the plan of success is concerned. Study yourself and determine your ambitions. Are you motivated by selfish interests, or are you willing to cooperate with others? Are you willing to share your good fortune with your fellow man, that all may profit by your cooperative undertaking? You can never make a success of your life if you try to shut out the other fell. No, you must share your life with others, for the more you share with others, the more valuable your share will become. By sharing your life with others, others become dependent upon you for leadership and will pay you a greater price for your services. Discovery of your true worth is a matter of advertising to others through your services. You are selling your thoughts, so make sure that they are of equality that will demand a high price. Regardless of the price you get for your thoughts, they still belong to you and can be used over and over again. The more share with others the more you keep for yourself do unto others as you would have them do unto you what is it you expect in life there may be many things you desire but what do you actually expect to attain daydreaming about what you would do with a million dollars will never give you the courage to go out and get it once you have determined the thing you most desire you have to start building a thought image with the expectation of attaining it the struggle necessary to accomplish your purpose is of but little consequence. Expectation will drive you on. A person will never be able to accomplish that which he does not expect. He must be careful not to place his limitations too close. Of course, there will be many difficulties and obstacles in his path, no matter what his preparation and determination and whatever is easily accomplished will be of little value. However, as we start to accomplish, we should expect to win. Your degree of success will be governed by the quality of the success thoughts you produce. There is no other way. You must either direct your inner consciousness through your own creative thought, or you will find that it is following the direction of others. The power of success lies within the birthplace of success in your consciousness. Never mind about the supply of power. You need only to make the demand and supply the thought path through which that power will be given physical expression, you will find that the more you use, the more will be supplied. You will receive all we are prepared to use. Such is the law of nature. Once you have made the demand upon your inner consciousness through the production of creative tout, you have to hang on until you have accomplished your purpose. As you can imagine, our discussion of thoughtsmanship has stimulated my own inner consciousness. My memory thoughts have presented many recollections from past years, and I am sure the reader will pardon me if I share a memory picture with him. It is only one of many instances which have proven to me the power of thoughtsmanship. Years ago, a young man placed his faith in thoughtsmanship to gratify his desire to become a doctor. The day he mounted the steps of his chosen institution of learning, Carr read in his pocket the total sum of $176. He knew that such a meager sum would never take him through the years of study that lay ahead, but he had deposited her of determined, creative thoughts in his inner consciousness. All the urge they were exerting on him as his inner consciousness sought to give physical expression to those thoughts. He wasn't trusting to luck, for he had had other experiences with this inner consciousness of his that warranted the faith he had always placed therein. 
Perhaps at times, the long years of struggle taxed his faith, but it was never dimmed. The vision of final success remained bright and clear. There were some heart-rending experiences, even beyond what he had expected. But always, an opportunity was presented to him to earn necessary money to pay his room and tuition fees. At times, he felt the pangs of hunger, but his determination never faltered. At long last, graduation day arrived. Bossmanship had pulled him through. Of course, his struggle didn't end with the receipt of his degree. There was much more work to do before he could hang out his shingle and announce to suffering humanity that he was ready to relieve men of their pain and suffering. But that day finally came, too, when he boarded a train for home. After purchasing his ticket, he found that he had exactly $17.53 in his pocket. Not enough to pay for the shingle he had dreamed of having, not to mention the numerous pieces of office equipment to be purchased, and even in those days, the landlord's nasty habit of demanding the rent in advance. There was still need for a strong heart and determined thought. He did not borrow from friends or relatives. The same determination that caused him to work his way through school caused him to shun all such favors. He decided to locate in a small town where he knew no one. Something deep down seemed to drive him on. It was his image of the future office dimmed by doubt and fear. I should say not. It was crystal clear, complete in every detail. Only one thing was lacking a bank account. But by the time he arrived in his small town, even a solution to that problem had been worked out. He selected an office and assured the landlord that he would sign the lease and give him a check for the first month's rent the next day. At the moderately priced hotel, he proudly signed his name to the registry. Drive. Then he retired to his room. The evening was spent in deep thought. He sketched the plan of his new office and listed the equipment necessary to carry out his work. Without a single doubt as to the successful consummation of his plan, he slept peacefully that night. The next morning, at After a meager breakfast, he took stock of his financial status. He now had $3.08. In his mind, however, were plans to change that financial picture before the day was over. He possessed a wealth of creative thought and anticipated the rewards it would bring. When the bank opened, he entered with firm and confident step and approached a kind-looking old gentleman seated at one of the desks who asked him to sit down. Introducing himself, the young man stated his business frankly and thoroughly. What security have you? Asked the banker discreetly. All the security I need to make a success in my profession, the young man replied. He placed his $3.08 on the desk. That's all I have outside of my head. For a long moment, their gazes met. The older man's eyes revealed surprise, while the younger man's eyes revealed determination and self-confidence. There can be no doubt of the transference of thought in that moment. Creative thoughts were being implanted in the inner consciousness of the older man. Did he consider those thoughts to be his own? That must have been the case. For after moments of silence, the banker's eyes softened with a self-conscious smile. He said, I don't think there is any question of your making good. As he began pulling, Added, it's just that your request is so unusual. No, the story doesn't end there. Applying thoughtsmanship, the young man launched forth on a very successful career. He didn't stop using that power of thoughtsmanship just because he had obtained a thousand dollars. Thoughtsmanship continued to prove itself over and over. Always, the plan was the same a creative thought planted in inner consciousness and careful preparation for the day of its expression into the physical. This 
thoughtful life produced even greater confidence, freedom from doubt and fear, and the satisfying reward of health, happiness, and prosperity. See, this message is not just so many pages of printed matter. I have lived every truth I am presenting here. If you desire it enough, you can live it too. For what you think you live, what you think you do. What you think you are. Everyone wants something in this life, so let's get going. We can never accomplish anything without making a start. It's true that the rewards of accomplishment make the good starter, but that is about all they do, just awaken. Not enough to be a good starter, but then must be a good finisher also. Carefully think out a plan before making that start, and you will be sure your start is in the right direction. Never start toward a goal that is hidden from sight, that is, from your mental sight. Choose a goal that is within your reach. Think out a plan of procedure, and once you have attained the goal, then plan the one beyond. Application of thoughtsmanship will open up vistas to you that have probably never before dreamed of possibility ties that will astound. Of course, if a person doesn't believe it, he will not bother to make the application. And nothing will happen. But for you, believing and applying thoughtsmanship life will be gloriously brighter and more rewarding. There is nothing mysterious about thoughtsmanship. There is nothing new about men thinking the way through life. We have known hundreds of such thinkers. Their names are recorded in the halls of fame of history. We recognize what thought did for them, whatever name they may have applied to it, so why not apply what I choose to call thoughtsmanship? It is no mystic theory whereby fame and fortune are attained overnight. 
I simply urge you to plan the expression of your life. Since the expression of your life is controlled by your thoughts, then you must plan your thoughts. Learning to use thoughtsmanship is somewhat like learning to drive an automobile. The power is there awaiting the drift or spitting. You can not only make use of it, but as we all will soon realize, the expression of that power must be guided much the same as the car must be steered else. The power within your body is far greater than that of an automobile. It is, in fact, beyond human comprehension, but it is under your guidance. However, you must make sure that you have a working knowledge of thoughtsmanship, not just a smattering of knowledge concerning the theory. A hasty reading of these words will not make you a master thoughtsman. Simply acknowledging thoughtsmanship is a beautiful philosophy is not enough either. You must live it. You must make it a part of your everyday life. Apply it to every expression of life in all of its ramifications. The more you depend upon thoughtsmanship, the richer your entire life will be. The knowledge you now possess will aid you in living a more natural life when your thought patterns are created in harmony with nature. Your only possible stumbling block is the failure to recognize your inner power within your inner consciousness in your relationship with Recognize these facts, accept them. Thoughtsmanship is as natural as life itself, and everything must follow the natural laws. Allow your consciousness of life to lead you into a closer man/slash nature relationship. I mean, man/slash nature relationship, man/slash nature relationship, the foundation of the Shackley philosophy. Let us now explore this relationship to fully understand the concept. It will first be necessary for us to delve into the man slash nature relationship from the beginning of time. We want to know what man is and why he is. We want to know more about the living power resident within man that makes him different from all other animals. There is no need to be concerned about me launching into a religious discussion. I have my religious beliefs, and I respect the privilege of others to express their beliefs in their own way. However, I truly believe that my explanation of the man slash nature relationship will strengthen all our faiths, no matter how we choose to express them. There is a creative intelligence within this universe, and whether we liken it to the creator, if it's some other name, makes little difference to our purposes here. this message, it is my hope to encourage the evolution of consciousness and a better understanding of the creation of all things and to prepare you to realize more fully your true relationship to nature. Together we will determine what man is and why he is, along with his potentialities, both physical and mental. Yes, and I include the spiritual endowment as one of man's possessions. It matters not what position in life you hold. It is possible for you to bring about changes in your life that will be truly astounding. It is not common for man to be completely satisfied with his present situation. If man were completely satisfied, there would be no incentive for him to progress. Regardless of your present financial situation, state of health, environment, or educational level, there is always room for improvement. You can make such improvement if you will only determine to do so. Can master the future. Several decades ago, Henry the boy looked up at the ceiling of his bedroom. He stared in wonderment, for he could still see a tiny crack in the plaster, and it was just as plain as it had been the day before and the day before that, in fact, as it had always been as far back as he could remember during his short life. His wonderment was caused by his recollection of the doctor's words to his mother the evening before, after completing an examination of the boy. Mrs. Shackley, the doctor said, I have sad news for you. Our little one can only live a short time. The boy was to overhear the forbidding phrase many times over in the weeks and months to follow from well-meaning relatives and neighbors. It was their humble way of helping to prepare my mother for the inevitable. But this morning, I said to myself, I'm still alive and I'm going to stay alive. That determination was the only promise of life. Only those who have experienced such condemnation to death can understand the resentment that built up in my consciousness at that time. That life of suffering and confinement to bed was the only life I knew, but the sweet fragrance of the spring morning 
and often through the open window for me. With a joyous appreciation of life, and I determined to live. In the tortuous months and years that followed, I was to go on hearing the discouraging prediction, but each time it merely added more strength to be able to live. No wonder that tiny crack in the ceiling became so important to me, for it was the gauge by which I measured my vitality. To me, the ability to see that tiny crack meant death. However, the day did come when I would no longer see that crack in the ceiling. But not because I succumbed or because death freed me of my pain and suffering, but because my parents decided to move to the country, whereas I had overheard them say, our little boy will be close to nature and have a chance to gain strength. The move was made, and being close to nature, my frail body did regain its strength. The memory of those years of pain and torment remain vivid even today. Could it be that those years of torment gave birth to the Shackley philosophy? I truly believe that the pain and suffering did instill greater determination and perhaps did encourage the development of a more philosophical attitude toward life. One cannot lie flat on his back and have nothing to look at except a crack and seal him for several years without developing a greater sense of concentrative and ADVRSITY often leads to success. So many it was a blessing in disguise, for nature may not speak in audible tones, but she certainly does make her values known to all who are willing to receive her message. One thing is certain, man can always depend upon nature, for nature is one constant factor, life and always works for the benefit of man, although at times it may not seem that way. As a better understanding of man's relationship with nature will help you meet and overcome any problems that lie ahead. Such information as you gain from the study of this message should give you the determination to face your problems with firm resolution to win. I am not asking you to accept these statements as something based upon theory. These are facts of life. I have lived these facts and nature has never let me down. At the time of my awakening to the true relationship and to the full realization that it was a privilege to live with all other creatures of nature, I determined to live by her rules. And that if I disobeyed the rules, I would be called upon to suffer the consequences. And two, that no special dispensation would be inaugurated for my benefit. Nature's laws are fixed laws and must be obeyed by all. Anyone attempting to break them becomes the promoter of his own discomfort. He may not fall prostrate following his first act of disobedience, but some portion of his mind or body will suffer damage. I have counseled the sins of such offenders and have traced their present suffering to some acts of disobedience to nature's laws. Whether the act be one of omission or commission, the penalty remains the same. You must either obey or suffer the consequences. Is that in any way a judgment on your law?
not what position in life you hold, it is possible for you to bring about changes in your life that will be truly astounding. It is not common for man to be completely satisfied with his present situation. If men were completely satisfied, there would be no incentive for him to progress. Regardless of your present financial situation, state of health, environment, or educational level, there is always room for improvement. You can make such improvement if you will only determine to do so. Yes, you can master the future. Several decades ago, an Iowa boy looked up at the ceiling of his bedroom. He stared in wonderment, for he could still see a tiny crack in the plaster, and it was just as plain as it had been the day before and the day before that, in fact, as it had always been as far back as he could remember during his short life. His wonderment was caused by his recollection of the doctor's words to his mother the evening before, after completing an examination of the boy. Mrs. Shackley, the doctor said, I have sad news for you. The little one can only live a short time. The boy was to overhear the forbidding phrase many times over in the weeks and months to follow from well-meaning relatives and neighbors. It was their humble way of helping to prepare my mother for the inevitable. But this morning, I said to myself, I'm still alive and I'm going to stay alive. That determination was the only promise of life. Those who have experienced such condemnation to death can understand the resentment that built up in my consciousness at that time. That life of suffering and confinement to bed was the only life I knew. But the sweet fragrance of the spring morning that wafted through the open window filled me joyous appreciation of life and I determined to live. In the tortuous months and years that followed, I was to go on hearing the discouraging prediction. Each time it merely added more strength to my will to live. No wonder that tiny crack in the ceiling became so important to me, for it was the gauge by which I measured my vitality. To me, the ability to see that tiny crack meant death. However, the day did come when I would no longer see that crack in the ceiling not because I succumbed or because death freed me of my pain and suffering, but because my parents decided to move to the country, whereas I had overheard them say, our little boy will be close to nature and have a chance to gain strength. The move was made, and being close to nature, my frail body did regain its strength, but the memory of those years of pain and torment remained vivid even today. Could it be that those years of torment gave birth to the Shackley philosophy? I truly believe that the pain and suffering did instill greater determination and perhaps did encourage the development of a more philosophical attitude toward life. One cannot lay flat on his back and have nothing to look at except a crack in the ceiling for several years without developing a greater sense of concentrate I O N A D V E R S I T Y often leads to success. So maybe it was a blessing in disguise. For nature may not speak in audible tones, but she certainly does make her values known to all who are willing to receive her message. One thing is certain and can always depend upon nature. For nature is the one constant factor, life and always works for the benefit of man, although at times it may not seem that way. As a better understanding of man's relationship with nature will help you meet and overcome any problems that lie ahead. Such information as you gain from the study of this message should give you the determination to face your problems with firm resolution to win. I'm not asking you to accept these statements as something based upon theory. These are facts of life. I have lived these facts and nature has never let me down. At the time of my awakening to the true relationship and to the full realization that it was a privilege to live with all other creatures of nature, I determined to live by her rules. I knew that if I disobeyed the rules, I would be called upon to suffer the consequences. I knew too that no special dispensation would be inaugurated for my benefit. Nature's laws are fixed laws and must be obeyed by all. Anyone attempting to break them becomes the promoter of his own discomfort. He may not fall prostrate following his first act of disobedience, but some portion of his mind or body will suffer damage. I have counseled thou sand of such offenders and have traced their present suffering to some act or acts of disobedience to nature's laws. Whether the act be one of omission or commission, the penalty remains the same. 
must either obey or suffer the consequences. Is that in any way a judgment on your wrongdoing? The penalty, too, is a fixed law. Did contrary to the natural laws at one time or another, and we have all experienced the inevitable penalty, and I trust that this message will encourage you to live a more natural life and thus escape the inevitable penalties. Don't try to excuse yourself for the suffering you have endured by quoting the often repeated phrase, it is God's will. It would be better for you to say, it is because of my own stubborn will. It would be well, however, for you to remember that the laws of nature, the will of the Creator, His infinite wisdom, will all things that ever have existed, or now, or ever will exist. But are you going to accept these plainly stated facts and cultivate a man slash nature relationship? The study of the facts herein recorded may save untold pain and suffering. But in the life hereafter, wherever or whatever that life, not what position in life you hold. It is possible for you to bring about changes in your life that will be truly astounding. It is not common for man to be completely satisfied with his present situation. If man were completely satisfied, there would be no incentive for him to progress. Regardless of your present financial situation, state of health, environment, or educational level, there is always room for improvement. You can make such improvement if you will only determine to do so. Yes, you can master the future. Several decades ago, an Iowa boy looked up at the ceiling of his bedroom. He stared in wonderment, for he could still see a tiny crack in the plaster. It was just as plain as it had been the day before and the day before that, in fact, as it had always been as far back as he could remember during his short life. His wonderment was caused by his recollection the doctor's words to his mother the evening before, after completing an examination of the boy. Mrs. Shackley, the doctor said, I have sad news for you. The little one can only live a short time. The boy was to overhear the forbidding phrase many times over in the weeks and months to follow from well-meaning relatives and neighbors. With their humble way of helping to prepare my mother for the inevitable. But this morning, I said to myself, I'm still alive and I'm going to stay alive. That determination was the only promise of life. Only those who have experienced such condemnation to death can understand the resentment that built up in my consciousness at that time. That life of suffering and confinement to bed was the only life I knew, but the sweet fragrance of the spring morning that wafted through the open window filled me with joyous appreciation of life and I determined to live. The tortuous months and years that followed, I was to go on hearing the discouraging prediction. Each time it merely added more strength to my will to live. No wonder that tiny crack in the ceiling became so important to me, for it was the gauge by o'clock. which I measured my vitality. To me, the ability to see that tiny crack in death. However, the day did come when I would no longer see that crack in the ceiling, but not because I succumbed or because death freed me of my pain suffering because my parents decided to move to the country as I had overheard them say our little boy will be close to nature and have a chance to gain strength. It was made and being close to nature, my frail body did regain its strength, but the memory of those years of pain and torment remain vivid even today. Could it be that those years of torment gave birth to the Shackley philosophy? I truly believe that the pain and suffering did instill greater determination and perhaps did encourage the development of a more philosophical attitude toward life. One cannot lie flat on his back and have nothing to look at except a crack 
concealment for several years without developing a greater sense of consensual TIO and ADVERSITY often leads to success. So maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Nature may not speak in audible tones, but she certainly does make her values known to all who are willing to receive her message. One thing is certain, one can always depend upon nature. For nature is the one constant factor of life and always works for the benefit of man, although at times it may not seem that way. As a better understanding of man's relationship with nature will help you meet and overcome any problems that lie ahead. Such information as you gain from the study of this message should give you the determination to face your problems with firm resolution to win. I am not asking you to accept these statements as something based upon theory. These are facts of life. I have lived these facts and nature has never let me down. At the time of my awakening to the true relationship and to the full realization that it was a privilege to live with all other creatures of nature, I determined to live in her rules. If I disobeyed the rules, I would be called upon to suffer the consequences. And two, that no special dispensation would be inaugurated for my benefit. Nature's laws are fixed laws and must be obeyed by all. Anyone attempting to break them becomes the promoter of his own discomfort. He may not fall prostrate following his first act of disobedience, but some portion of his mind or body will suffer damage. Have counseled thou sins of such offenders and have traced their present suffering to some acts of disobedience to nature's laws. Whether the act be one of omission or commission, the penalty remains the same. You must either obey or suffer the consequences. Is that in any way a judgment on your wrongdoing? The penalty, too, is a fixed law. We have all acted contrary to the natural laws at one time or another, and we have all experienced the inevitable penalty, and I trust that this message will encourage you to live a more natural life and thus escape the inevitable penalties. Don't try to excuse yourself for the suffering you have endured by quoting that often repeated phrase, it is God's will. It would be better for you to say, it is because of my own stubborn will. It would be well, however, for you to remember that the laws of nature, the will of the Creator, His infinite wisdom, will all things that ever have existed now or ever will exist. You're going to accept these plain stated facts and cultivate a man slash nature relationship. A study of the facts here and recorded may save untold pain and suffering. In the life hereafter, wherever or whatever that life may be, in all the years spent on earth. If you are to gain greater health, happiness, and prosperity, you must recognize the reason such betterment comes to be. But one thing you can be sure, you can never trust to luck. The man who trusts to luck will soon find that he is lucky to grasp the crumbs that fall from a successful man's table. Your thoughts create our luck. For whatsoever a man soeth, so shall he reap. People think of nature as an enemy. But nature isn't the enemy. Man is the enemy of nature. His selfishness, he tries to do things to satisfy his own ego instead of trying to do the things that make it natural to cooperate with nature. <coughs> if we take a path that is contrary to the law of nature, we break her laws and then we find ourselves defeated in the attempt. Each one of us has to arrange his own life in the way he wants it and he will find it easier to arrange that life by studying nature and cooperating with it. The more we delve into the secrets of nature, the more we are convinced that that which we call nature is but an expression of the Creator. The more we realize that every single element man has discovered and put to use for his own selfish purposes is simply a gift of nature. Nature is man's storehouse of supply. The shackle of philosophy operates on the premise that creative energy constitutes the life force of all living things in both the animal and vegetable kingdoms, and that such a life force is intelligently directed by the creative intelligence. If our life force is creative energy directed in all its activity by the creative intelligence, what is nature? I believe that that which we call nature is simply the expression of that life force. Every living thing then is a product of nature, including man. I hope that I am not setting too rapid a pace in my explanation of living a man slash nature relationship. If it seems so, if there is some sense of uncertainty, I to return to the beginning.
instead of every statement that I have made so far. I've tried not to become expansive or vociferous in the writing of this message. I prefer to place nothing on these pages that is not directly related to the expression of life and man's relationship to nature. This must, however, be read and reread until the truths become a part of your consciousness. I've lived in close communion with nature for most of my life, and this message has been confined to the mere statement of facts as I see them. But the final determination of their value lies with those who make the effort to assimilate the concepts included here. I'm sure you have accepted the fact that man is endowed with a life force, a force that is on a par with all other living things. Can it be possible that your life force is created within your body? Such a supposition brings us to the often repeated question, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Of course, there would be no creation of body to you without this life force. Life force is the energy that causes growth and action in all living things. Without it, we would have only inanimate objects. All things would be powerless. While still a young schoolboy, I asked my school teacher, what is life? Possessing a very inquisitive nature, I asked her many, many questions and always got a reasonably clear answer. So I expected to get an enlightening answer to this question, too. However, this time she failed to come up with an answer of any value. She said simply that no one knew what life was and that we only knew that we were alive. Well, I already knew, so I followed through with several other questions. One was, does the old cow in the pasture know she is alive? She said, yes, she knows she is alive. She doesn't know that she knows she is alive. The teacher didn't seem to appreciate my line of questioning. She told me to study the lesson she had assigned for that day. Of course, I wasn't satisfied with her answer, but I didn't want to stay after school and listen to a lecture about being too inquisitive for my own good. She had already given me several of those lectures. So I settled down to my assignment and promised myself that I would find answers to my probing questions somewhere. The more this I a boy searched for the secrets of nature. As I matured, I realized that to carry on the research. What I desired an educational plan had to be formed. But even then, the one burning question that was uppermost in my mind was never answered by any of my college professors either. The search was destined to continue, and that search has never ceased. In my search, I have uncovered nature's many facets. There is a rare quality in nature that appeals to us all, yet man has failed to recognize this true relationship with nature. The purpose of this message is to reveal certain facts concerning such a relationship. I have no theory to present, for I prefer to relate only the facts I have uncovered during more than 70 years of study and research in the field of natural things. Nature, as we view her, is but an expression of the Creator. Living things that exist upon the face of this earth are such an expression. Therefore, speak of such living objects as being products of nature. All such products make the whole is part of nature and is subject to the will of the Creator. Man's relationship with nature, that of mother and child. True man was endowed with the power of reason and given dominion over all things, but this does not come above the laws of nature. He must obey the laws if he is to avoid suffering mental and physical hardships. Nature demands harmony. Come with me as I relive the past 70 years of cooperation with nature. In mind that a joyous, successful life is never operated on a hit or miss basis. Attaining a worthwhile goal necessitates careful planning. One day's planning can never be correlated with that of another unless we first establish a goal. Our first goal should be living in harmony with nature, for the laws of nature are fixed laws. They will never change, so we must adjust our lives in accordance with their demands. To open this discussion, let us ask of ourselves what makes all the activity of this earth possible. So that all activity is due to the flow of energy, what about the source of such energy? The flow of energy is too stable to be some whirlwind occurrence. It has a purpose and is performing a life-giving task. It is the only energy expressed upon this earth and is being harnessed by man and put to all kinds of uses. Nothing could exist without it so it would appear to be the most important element in nature. 
It is very important that we relate ourselves to nature so that we can sense it and let it influence our activity. Of course, we do see some destruction wherever man has tread left his mark on the face of nature because man by nature is an egotistical fellow and liable to march the beauty that nature has produced. So in your study of your relationship with nature, you should endeavor to realize that each one of the objects that you observe has a place in the scheme of things. You should feel by this time that you have become more conscious of your life force and your relationship with life. Well, suppose we consider your relationship with your life force on more personal terms. You've got to live with it the rest of your life, for this is your life, and it's about time you became better acquainted. Us must ever lose sight of the fact our creative life force is an endowment of the creator of all things and uses our bodies as a temporary dwelling place that is a part of the creative intelligence. Nevertheless, we are closely related to it, so let us call it our inner consciousness. You depend upon your inner consciousness for energy and the intelligence of your bodily functions. That is a foregone conclusion, but you may depend upon it still further. And it will never fail you. The creator of all things has but one way of dominating actions that take place on the face of this earth, and that is through the life force. The life force is that which makes you alive, that which is the inside, and you feel the life force surging through your body. Many times, no doubt, you have heard, if not said yourself, well, it's just good to be alive. I feel so alive this morning. You actually feel the surge of life's energy within you. The main thing is to remember that that life energy is the life force generated in the creative center of the universe. We'll try to draw a clearer picture of the creative energy without which this earth would be a desolate place without living things. Of course, without the creative intelligence to direct such energy, a systematic expression would
face of nature, because man, by nature, is an egotistical fellow and liable to march the beauty that nature has produced. So in your study of your relationship with nature, you should endeavor to realize that each one of the objects that you observe has a place in the scheme of things. You should feel by this time that you have become more conscious of your life force and your relationship with life. Well, suppose we consider your relationship with your life force on more personal terms. You've got to live with it the rest of your life, for this is your life, and it's about time you became better acquainted. Of us must ever lose sight of the fact our creative life force is an endowment of the creator of all things and uses our bodies as a temporary dwelling place that is a part of the creative intelligence. Nevertheless, we are closely related to it, so let us call it our inner consciousness. You depend upon your inner consciousness for energy and the intelligent sense of your bodily functions. That is a foregone conclusion, but you may depend upon it still further and it will never fail you. The creator of all things has but one way of dominating the actions that take place on the face of this earth, and that is through the life force. The life force is that which makes you alive, that which is the inside, and you feel the life force surging through your body. Many times, no doubt, you have heard, if not said yourself, well, it's just good to be alive. I feel so alive this morning. You actually feel the surge of life's energy within you. The thing is to remember that that life energy is the life force generated in the creative center of the universe. I will try to draw a clearer picture of the creative energy without which this earth would be a desolate place without living things. Of course, without the creative intelligence to direct such energy, systematic expression would not exist. The Shackley philosophy is an outgrowth of our discoveries in our study and research in the field of things natural. We want you to share our good fortune and learn to live a more happy and contented life. This creative energy gives life to all things. If it were to cease for even one second, every living thing on the face of this earth would crumble into dust and their elements would return to the earth. Creative energy, then, is our life force. We are alive because of it. We say to you, I'm alive. Yes, we are alive, and we will remain alive, as long as these bodies of ours remain a fit place for the creative energy to operate. We see it as that. Creative energy that gives us mobility. Every function within our bodies is an expression of creative energy. The heartbeat, digestion, brain processes, in fact, everything that makes us a living organism, all these are dependent upon creative energy. Man's physical body functions are about on a part of those we have termed our animals. So far as their life force is concerned, there is no difference. Both are alive. Each is endowed with a life spark by the creator. Yes, that life force within us is a gift of the creative life force, a part of the creative energy of the universe. This creative energy will continue to give less expression to our bodies as long as we provide the needed nutrition to keep our bodies in good repair. If for any reason our bodies deteriorate to such a degree that they are no longer a fit place to dwell, our life force departs, leaving the physical body without the power of expression. From where does such energy flow? From the creative center of the universe exact location is not nearly as important to us as the fact that it continues to flow through our bodies. But what good is our body once our life force has ceased flowing through it? Creative energy is our life force. Ask yourself why life is expressed on this earth. You know you are alive, but you don't know why. As the school teacher explained to me in my early childhood, the old cow in the pasture, where she was alive. Of course, she qualified that statement with the assertion that she doesn't know she knows she is alive. My, what a profound revelation of fact. Who knows that clumsy answer may have acted as a stimulus to prod me onto greater effort in my work. A very fine Christian lady once admonished me about trying to determine the why and wherefore of the Creator. She felt that it was bordering on sacrilege for me to question the workings of nature. I tried to convince her that it was not sacrilegious to attempt to learn more about man's relationship with the creator. I was trying to uncover facts of life, not trying to disprove them. 
I have not uncovered all of the facts of life, but my research work has been very rewarding. How I wish I could find the time to write a full and complete report of my findings. However, my remaining time on this earth would not allow me the necessary time to complete the work. So I will record enough of the facts in this message to give you a better understanding of your relationship with nature and trust that you will continue your studies throughout your lifetime. Now let us determine what life is. Don't say that's going too deep. To you, as to me, it should present the challenge. As long as I know I'm alive, why not determine what the life force is? First, we must determine that it is a force. Then we must discover its source. This is no time to speculate as to the possibilities of our determining its source, or we are dealing with the cause of our existence, yours and mine. Nothing could be more important to us, nor should we say why not leave well enough alone. We know it to be our most prized position, and we should do everything within our power to protect it. As our life force is our most precious possession, why do we speak of it as our life force? Because it's a flow of energy, an energy that expresses every activity within our bodies. We cannot move a single muscle without such energy. Science has never been able to fathom the mystery of the creative life force. We must therefore accept it as part of the great unknown. But this in no way prevents us from realizing our relationship with life. Once you become fully aware of that relationship, it will be possible for you to inaugurate certain changes that will be astounding for the ultimate result. No longer will you live a life without directed purpose, with recognition of your relationship with creative energy. Life will take on new meaning, and you will progressively advance until you have built a whole new concept of life. If you are to realize your relationship with life, you must embrace the evolution of consciousness. Don't cringe from that phrase. It simply means an expression of your intelligence. To clarify further, evolution within the universal sphere is the result of universal intelligence in your consciousness, while evolution within your mental sphere is the result of your own individual. Dual intelligence educated consciousness. Evolution, as you know, is progressive change, advancement. Evolution of consciousness, then, is an advancement toward a goal brought about by the expression of your intelligence. It is also a consciousness of the power which makes advancement possible and of the degree of control you, as an individual, possess over that power. Nature plays no favorites. So far as she is concerned, women are born equal. Society alone is responsible for different stations in life. There are no different degrees in the inner powers of man, that endowment of the creator which we call inner consciousness. Our inner consciousness has the power to express our in whatsoever manner. Educated consciousness directs. First, understand yourself. That nature has placed certain limitations on you may be obvious, but never are those limitations as severe as those placed on yourself by the thoughts you produce. It is easy to comprehend physical limitations. Inherited talents are yet. Slash nature relationship. 
if it seems so, or if there is some sense of uncertainty, or to return to the beginning and the study of every statement I have made so far. I have tried not to become expansive or vociferous in the writing of this message. I prefer to place nothing on these pages that is not directly related to the expression of life and man's relationship to nature. This must, however, be written reread until the truths become a part of your consciousness. I have lived in close communion with nature for most of my life, and this message has been confined to the mere statement of facts as I see them. But the final determination of their value as with those who make the effort to assimilate the concepts included here. I'm sure you have accepted the fact that man is endowed with a life force, a force that is on a par with all other living things. Can it be possible that your life force is created within your body? Such a supposition brings us to the often repeated question, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Of course, there would be no creation of body to you without this life force. The life force is the energy that causes growth and action in all living things. Without it, we would have only inanimate objects. All things would be powerless. While still a young schoolboy, I asked my school teacher, what is life? Possessing a very inquisitive nature, I asked her many, many questions and always got a reasonably clear answer. So I expected to get an enlightening answer to this question, too. However, this time she failed to come up with an answer of any value.
that simply had no one knew what life was and that we only knew that we were alive. Well, I already knew that, so I followed through with several other questions. One of them was, does the old cow the pasture know she is alive? She said, yes, she knows she is alive, but she doesn't know that she knows she is alive. The teacher didn't seem to appreciate my line of questioning. She told me to study the lesson she had assigned for that day. Of course, I wasn't satisfied with her answer, but I didn't want to stay after school and listen to a lecture about being too inquisitive for my own good. She had already given me several of those lectures. So I settled down to my assignment and promised myself that I would find the answers to my probing questions somewhere. And more this I of a boy searched for the secrets of nature. As I matured, I realized that to carry on the research or speak of such living objects as being products of nature, all such products make the whole. Man is part of nature and is subject to the creator. Man's relationship with nature is that of mother and child. True man was endowed with the power of reason and given dominion over all things, but this does not put him above the laws of nature. He must obey the laws if he is to avoid suffering mental and physical hardships. Nature demands harmony. Come with me as I relive the past 70 years of cooperation with nature. Bear in mind that a joyous, successful life is never operated on a hit or miss basis. Attaining a worthwhile goal necessitates careful planning. One day's planning can never be correlated with that of another unless we first establish a goal. Our first goal should be living in harmony with nature, for the laws of nature are fixed laws that will never change, so we must adjust our lives in accordance with their demands. To open this discussion, let us ask of ourselves what makes all the activity on this earth possible. We know that all activity is due to the flow of energy. What about the source of such energy? The flow of energy is too stable to be some whirlwind occurrence. It has a purpose and is performing life-giving task. It is the only energy expressed upon this earth and is being harnessed by man and put to all kinds of uses. Nothing could exist without it, so it would appear to be the most important element in nature. It is very important that we relate ourselves to nature so that we can sense it and let it influence our activity. Of course, we do see some destruction wherever man has tread and left his work on the face of nature because man, by nature, is an egotistical fellow and liable to march the beauty that nature has produced. So in your study of your relationship with nature, you should endeavor to realize that each one of the objects that you observe has a place in the scheme of things. You should feel by this time that you have become more conscious of your life force and your relationship with life. Well, suppose we consider your relationship with your life force on more personal terms. You've got to live with it the rest of your life, for this is your life, and it's about time you became better acquainted. None of us must ever lose sight of the fact our creative life force is an endowment of the creator of all things and uses our bodies as a temporary dwelling place that is a part of the creative intelligence. Nevertheless, we are closely related to it, so let us call it our inner consciousness. You depend upon your inner consciousness for energy and the intelligence of your bodily functions. That is a foregone conclusion. You may depend upon it still further, and it will never fail you. The creator of all things has but one way of dominating the actions that take place on the face of this earth, and that is through the life force. Life force is that which makes you alive, that which is the inside, and you feel the life force surging through your body. Many times, no doubt, you have heard, if not said yourself, well, it's just good to be alive. I feel so alive this morning. You actually feel the surge of life's energy within you. The main thing is to remember that that life energy is the life force generated in the creative center of the universe. I will try to draw a clearer picture of the creative energy without which this earth would be a desolate place without living things. Of course, without the creative intelligence to direct such energy, a systematic expression would not exist. The Shackley philosophy is an outgrowth of our discoveries in our study and research in the field of things natural. We want you to share our good fortune and learn to live a more happy and contented life. 
as creative energy gives life to all things. If it were to cease for even one second, every living thing on the face of this earth would crumble into dust and their elements would return to the earth. Creative energy that is our life force. We are alive because of it. We say to you, no, I'm alive. Yes, we are alive and we will remain alive as long as these bodies of ours remain a fit place for the creative energy to operate. Is that that gives us mobility. Every function within our bodies is an expression of creative energy. Our heartbeat, digestion, brain processes, in fact, everything that makes us a living organism, all these are dependent upon creative energy. Man's physical body functions are about on a par with those we have termed lower animals. So far as their life force is concerned, there is no difference. Both are alive. Each is endowed with a life spark by the creator. As that life force within us is a gift of the creative life force, a part of the creative energy of the universe. This creative energy will continue to give life's expression to our bodies as long as we provide the needed nutrition to keep our bodies in good repair. If for any reason our bodies deteriorate to such a degree that they are no longer a fit place to dwell, the life force departs, leaving the physical body without the power of expression. From where does such energy flow? From the creative center of the universe. The exact location is not as important to us as the fact that it continues to flow through our bodies. Of what good is our body once our life force has ceased flowing through it? Creative energy is our life force. Ask yourself what life is expressed on this earth. You do a life, but you don't know why. As the school teacher explained to me in my early childhood, old cow in the pasture when she was alive. Of course, she qualified that statement with the assertion that she doesn't know she knows she is alive. My, what a profound revelation of fact. But who knows that clumsy answer would have acted as a stimulus to prod me onto greater effort in my work. A few 
a fine Christian lady once admonished me about trying to determine the why and wherefore of the Creator. She felt that it was bordering on sacrilege for me to question the workings of nature. I tried to convince her that it was not sacrilegious to attempt to learn more about man's relationship with the Creator. I was trying to uncover facts of life, not trying to disprove them. I have not uncovered all of the facts of life, but my research work has been very rewarding. How I wish I could find the time to write a full and complete report of my findings. However, my remaining time on this earth would not allow me the necessary time to complete the work. So I will record enough of the facts in this message to give you a better understanding of your relationship with nature and trust that you will continue your studies throughout your time. Now let us determine what life is. Don't say that's going too deep. To prove this to me, you should present the challenge. As long as I know I'm alive, why not determine what the life force is? First, we must determine that it is a force. Then we must discover its source. This is no time to speculate as to the possibilities of our determining its source, for we are dealing with the cause of our existence, yours and mine. Nothing could be more important to us, neither should we say why not live well enough alone. We know it to be our most prized position, and we should do everything within our power to protect it. As our life force is our most precious possession, why do we speak of it as our life force? Because it is a flow of energy, and energy that expresses every activity within our bodies. We cannot move a single muscle without such energy. Science has never been able to fathom the mystery of the creative life force. We must therefore accept it as part of the great unknown. But this in no way prevents us from realizing our relationship with life. Once you become fully aware of that relationship, it will be possible for you to inaugurate certain changes that will be astounding for your ultimate result. No longer will you live a life without directed purpose, with recognition of your relationship with creative energy. Life will take on new meaning and you will progressively advance until you have built a whole new concept of life. If you are to realize your relationship with life, you must embrace the evolution of consciousness. Don't cringe from that phrase. It simply means an expression of our intelligence. To clarify further, evolution within the universal sphere, the race of universal intelligence in our consciousness, while evolution within your mental sphere is a result of your own individual. Intelligence educated consciousness. Evolution, as you know, is progressive change, advancement. Evolution of consciousness then is an advancement toward a goal brought about by the expression of your intelligence. Also, a consciousness of the power which makes advancement possible, and of the degree of control you, as an individual, possess over that power. Nature plays no favorites. So far as she is concerned, all men are born equal. Society alone is responsible for different stations in life. There are no different degrees in the inner powers of man, but endowment of the Creator, which we call her consciousness. Our inner consciousness has the power to express our in whatsoever manner our educated consciousness directs. First, to understand yourself that nature has placed certain limitations on you may be obvious, but never are those limitations as severe as those placed on yourself by the thoughts you produce. It is easy to comprehend physical limitations. Inherited talents are idle, more difficult to understand. It is this failing to understand your inherent abilities that finds you so often trying to place square as in round holes. Misfits are a direct result of misdirected thought. Too many ambitious men and women think only of the final success they wish to gain. They fail to properly consider the reason and the method of attainment. That method must fit your inherent abilities. Surgery may be an art, but there is a vast difference between the inherent ability of a successful surgeon and the inherent ability of a successful pianist. None of us can successfully accomplish a thing that is contrary to the endowment nature has bestowed upon us. We must first get acquainted with ourselves. Too often we try to copy the lifestyle or method of others who are successful even, though that method may be foreign to their nature. 
each of us must give our natural abilities an opportunity for expression. We are certain, however, the lack of development of your natural talents is not used as an excuse. Stop pretending to be that which you know you can never be. Discover your own natural talents and then develop them to the best of your ability. The expression of your life force is in your own hands. Your activities are the expression of your thoughts. Within your inner consciousness lies the power to make yourself the success you long to be. You do not allow it to give expression to success building thoughts. Your inner consciousness is an endowment of the universal intelligence. That intelligence will provide you with the answers if you will only depend on it. Do you doubt that statement? Then consider the statement made by Paul when he said, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Do you doubt the intelligence of that Spirit? That Spirit is what we have called your inner conscious. Yes, we are physical body it expresses, and that expression is under the direction of your educated consciousness. your thoughts, regardless of what may be said about you, or what action someone may take against you, you cannot be harmed unless you allow their words or actions to arouse the emotion of fear within you. That fear will deprive you of the power of reason, and you will produce thoughts that will be harmful to yourself. It is not what others say or do, but what you think that causes the harm. You are never a failure as long as you refuse to entertain failure thoughts. Success thoughts will force the expression of success in your life. The answer to your future success problems lie in the thought you produce on the subject. You have suffered a great deal, you say, because of the things others have said and have done. No, it was not the things said or done by others that caused your unhappiness, but your reaction to those things. Suppose someone has accused you falsely, has said some vile things about you, and has caused a friend to doubt you. You know nothing about the accusations as yet, so you are going blissfully about your business, happily enjoying the prospect of the future. Once you learn of such false accusations, what then? Why? The thoughts produced cause you to be unhappy. It have been a week or a month since the false statement was made, but as long as you were unaware of it, you were happy and content. Therefore, happiness is only a state of mind. As long as the other fellow cannot force you to think in happy thoughts, he cannot rob you of your happiness. You are, therefore, responsible yourself for the happiness that comes into your life, what you think you are. You must think your way through life. Thoughts produce action, and only through action can you attain that which is worthwhile and desired. I hope that when you have digested this message, you will thoroughly understand the Shackley philosophy. Rest assured that it will work for you, just as it has worked for the Shackley family. There can be no question about the power of such a philosophy. For all power is in nature, and we cooperate with nature. Can anyone view the systematic wonders of nature without pondering the existence of an infinite intelligence responsible for such a creation? If the display of wonders that meets the eye at every turn is a planned development, there must be a designing intelligence to create the plan. Without such intelligence, There would be no plan, and without them, there would be no orderly development. But the best show of orderly development may alone gives expression to a reasonably high degree of intelligence. It must have been given such an endowment of intelligence for a specific purpose. But the question now arises, are we fulfilling that purpose? Are we using our intelligence to promote a better understanding of things natural? We must plan our lives to be as closely in harmony with nature as it is possible for man to be. We are the contractors. Everything that we use is here upon this earth, was here in the beginning, and always will be here. Everything we use and everything that man can invent, all of our beautiful structures in the cities and the countryside. In everything man does, he must use a product of nature. That is the prime material with which he has to work. 
So why not endeavor to it now ourselves to nature and commune with nature? Because nature has provided us with every thought which is in building an idea. The thoughts of the creative intelligence are here free for the tacking, and it is almost unbelievable how so many of us refuse to listen to the voice of nature. At least 90% of everything that I have accomplished on this earth was forced upon me, not of my own making, because my educated intelligence isn't great enough to accomplish that purpose. It is a matter of developing the thoughts that supply to man by the creative intelligence supplied for everyone, if you will only listen and become conscious of the thoughts. The mind is being constantly bombarded with thoughts. All the thoughts of the universe, of this earth, at least, are here and crowding in upon us. All we need to do is listen and allow ourselves to become conscious of that which is commonly called inspiration. How can you apply this philosophy to your expression of life? By recognizing the creative energy and the creative intelligence that constitute your life force and by directing your every activity in harmony with the laws of nature. Recognize that you are a product of nature and that your very existence depends upon other products of nature. Respect the rights of those other products, whether they be man or beast or vegetable. Every product is placed on this earth for a specific purpose. By you fulfilling your purpose, you will find that living a life in harmony with nature is like playing a musical instrument in a symphony orchestra. A sour note may cause a great deal of discomfort not only to yourself but to others who also depend on an established harmony. We trust that every reader of this message will endeavor to live in harmony with nature. Are ready to start planning your life in accordance with her laws? It is not difficult. Just be natural, just be yourself, and thoughtfully direct your activities. I feel quite sure that by now you have progressed to that stage when you are aware of your relationship with life. You can now fully realize that your inner consciousness is an endowment of the creative intelligence, a part of creative life, and that you, educated consciousness, are the director of your life's expression. Thus, you realize that there are two units of intelligence operating within your body, each having a specific duty to perform, not always to pray. As we talk here, this means that you ought always to commune with your inner consciousness, be in harmony with, make known to, and depend upon it for the expression of your every desire. your thoughts, regardless of what may be said about you, or what actions someone may take against you, you can't be harmed unless you allow their words or actions to arouse the emotion of fear within you. That will deprive you of the power of reason, and you will produce thoughts that will be harmful to yourself. It's not what others say or do, but what you think that causes the harm. You are never a failure as long as you refuse to entertain failure thoughts. Success thoughts will force the expression of success in your life. The answer to your future success problems lie in the thought you produce on the subject. You have suffered a great deal, you say, because of the things others have said and have done. No, it was not the things said or done by others that caused your unhappiness, but your reaction to those things. Suppose someone has accused you falsely or has said some vile things about you and has caused a friend to doubt you. You know nothing about the accusation as yet, so you are going blissfully about your business, happily enjoying the prospect of the future. But once you learn of such false accusations, what then? Why? The thoughts produced cause you to be unhappy. It may have been a week or a month since the false statement was made. As long as you were unaware of it, you were happy and content. Therefore, happiness is only a state of mind. As long as the other fellow cannot force you to think in happy thoughts, he cannot rob you of your happiness. You are, before responsible yourself for the unhappiness that comes into your life, what you think you are. You must think your way through life. 
Thoughts produce action, and only through action can you obtain that which is worthwhile and desired. I hope that when you have digested this message, you will thoroughly understand the Shackley philosophy. Rest assured that it will work for you, just as it has worked for the Shackley family. There can be no question about the power of such a philosophy, for all power is in nature, and we cooperate with nature. Can anyone through the systematic wonders of nature, without pondering the existence of an infinite intelligence responsible for such a creation? If the display of wonders that meets the eye at every turn is a plan development, there must be a designing intelligence to create the plan. Without such an intelligence. No plan. And without a plan, there would be no orderly development. Under this show of orderly development, man alone gives expression to a reasonably high degree of intelligence. He must have been given such an endowment of intelligence for a specific purpose. But the question arises: Are we to promote a better kind of things natural? We must plan our lives to be as closely in harmony with. Nature as it is possible. Nature as it is possible for men to be. We are the contractors. Everything that we use is here upon this earth, was here in the beginning, and always will be here. Everything we use and everything that man can invent all of our beautiful structures in the cities and the countryside. Everything man does, he must be the product of nature the prime material with which he has to work. So why not endeavor to it in ourselves to nature and commune with nature? Because nature has provided us with every thought we use in building an idea. The thoughts of the creative intelligence are here, free for the tracking, and it is almost unbelievable how so many of us refuse to listen to the voice of nature. Ninety percent of everything that I have accomplished on this earth was forced upon me, not of my own making, because my educated intelligence is great enough to accomplish that purpose. It is a matter of developing the thoughts as supplied to man by the creative intelligence, supplied for everyone, if you will only listen and become conscious of the thoughts. Being constantly bombarded with thoughts, all the thoughts of the universe, of this earth, at least, are here and crowding in upon us. Need to do is listen and allow ourselves to become conscious of that which is commonly called inspiration. How can you apply this philosophy to your expression of life? By recognizing the creative energy and the creative intelligence that constitute your life force, and by directing every activity in harmony with the laws of nature. Recognize that you are a product of nature and that your very existence depends upon other products of nature or beast or beach table.
plan, and without a plan, there would be no orderly development. And it is shown of orderly development and no of expression to a reasonably high degree of intelligence. We must have been given such an endowment of intelligence for a specific purpose. But the question now arises are we fulfilling that purpose? Are we using our intelligence to permit the better understanding of things natural? We must plan our lives to be as closely in harmony with nature as it is possible for men to be. We are the contractors. Everything that we use is here upon this earth, was here in the beginning, and always will be here. Everything we use and everything that men can invent, all of our beautiful structures in the cities and the countryside. And everything men does, he must use a product of nature. That is the prime material with which he has to work. So why not endeavor to it ourselves to nature and commune with nature? Because nature has provided us with every thought which is in building an idea. The thoughts of the creative intelligence are here, free for the tacking, and it is almost unbelievable how so many of us refuse to listen to the voice of nature. At least 90% of everything I have accomplished on this earth was forced upon me out of my own mapping because my educated intelligence is great enough to accomplish that purpose. As a matter of developing, the thoughts is supplied to man by the creative intelligence, supplied for everyone if you would only listen and become conscious of the thoughts. The man is being constantly bombarded with thoughts. All the thoughts of the universe, of this earth, at least, are here and crowding in upon us. All we need to do is listen and allow ourselves to become conscious of that which is commonly called inspiration. How can you apply this philosophy to your expression of life? By recognizing the creative energy and the creative intelligence that constitute your life force and by directing your every activity in harmony with the laws of nature. Recognize that you are a product of nature and that your very existence depends upon other products of nature. Respect the rights of those other products, whether they be man or beast or vegetable. Every product is placed on this earth for a specific purpose. In fulfilling your purpose, you will find that living a life in harmony with nature is like playing a musical instrument in a symphony orchestra. A sour note may cause a great deal of discomfort, not only to yourself, but to others who also depend on an established harmony. We trust that every reader of this message will endeavor to live in harmony with nature. Be ready to start planning your life in accordance with her laws. It is not difficult. Just be natural, just be yourself, and thoughtfully direct your activities. Feel quite sure that by now you have progressed to that stage where you are aware of your relationship with life. You can now fully realize that your inner consciousness is an endowment of creative intelligence, a part of creative life, and that you, the educated consciousness, are the director of your life's expression. Thus, you realize that there are two units of intelligence operating within your body, each having a specific duty to perform, not always to pray. As we talk here, this means that you ought always to commune with your inner consciousness, be in harmony with, make known to, and depend upon it. For the expression of your every desire, your first aim should be to fully recognize the power of the creative life force within you. How can you ever expect to accomplish your purpose in life if you fail to recognize what makes such accomplishment possible? Life or life can be described best as an expression of creative energy. It is a part of all that ever was or ever will be. It is a part of universal creative energy. What your life may be, but an infinitesimal portion of universal energy, it possesses unlimited power in your own human sphere. Your body vibrates with energy, creative energy. You are a part of that energy. It is your life. The expression of life is a manifestation of the law of vibration. To acquire working knowledge of any subject, must understand its beginnings and the natural law under which it operates. Every cell in your body is vibrating in accordance with that law of vibration. There would be no expression without it. The biological element producing the physical is controlled by the same law that produces thought. The rate of vibration of certain brain cells produces thought. This is proven by recording brain. Thought waves on an electroencephalograph. We 
upon creative intelligence as absolute. All things exist because of it. It is directing the function of each tiny cell within our bodies as well as all other activities in the universe. As your consciousness evolves in the future, you will more fully grasp the significance of your relationship with such an all-powerful force. You will come to realize that your only force is the consciousness of the creator. You create self daily to yourself. You must draw from the vaults of nature the material necessary for such creation and recreation. Form the thought pattern and await the natural expression. The world about you is impressed by your creation. The gigantic mirror that reflects your expression of life. If confidence is expressed, then it will reflect confidence in us. Show interest in others, and others will have an interest in you. Shed happiness abroad, and reflected happiness will give you much joy. You must smile if you want others to smile upon you. That is the communications link between you and your inner consciousness, and your expression of these thoughts is your only means of communication with others. Our voices, our handwriting, and the nod of our heads all are expressions of that inner consciousness. There is no other channel through which the energy within you can be induced to create such physical actions. There are times when you are not even conscious of these physical actions. Your head in agreement without even thinking about what you are agreeing to. Your inner consciousness is expressing from your storehouse of memory agreement you had already reached some time in the past. It is acting upon your prior thoughts. Are you becoming conscious of your own power? The creative power of the universe is resident within you, and you have dominion over the expression of that power in the building of your success. Creative energy awaits your bidding. Craftsmanship will be your means of directing the expression of that energy in an intelligent manner. As we have discussed before, it is doubtful that any human being has ever reached the limit of possible expression. But there is a limit. That limit protects the universe from man's egoism. Yes, I know that many will not agree with me. But this ego of man has attempted to create an image of superiority for all living things. Things that are as much a part of nature as he is. He must therefore recognize that they too are important to the harmonious expression of nature. The fact that man has been endowed with the power of reason does give him an advantage over all other members of the animal kingdom. However, it does not place him above the laws of nature. is a product of nature, no more, no less. All living and non-living things are the products of nature. Force in man is the same force and is directed by the same creative intelligence that directs all other living things. Man differs from other living things only in his ability to reason. Reason is the intelligent consciousness of man that serves to direct the energies of the life force within him. And now with the power of reason, but he is the most unreasonable creature on earth. One would naturally suppose that with such a marvelous endowment, man would use his power of reason to control and direct his relationship with his fellow man. Unfortunately, only if you reason their way through life. Most people just feel their way through, allowing their emotions to direct their life's activity. To give expression to our emotions is a wonderful thing, as long as it affords have kindness to others, but when we are controlled by negative emotions, we find it unpleasant and often spread that displeasure. If you wish to relate properly to nature, you must learn to control your emotions. Don't say to you, simply can't control my emotions. You certainly can. Remember, you were given dominion over all things within your human limitations, of course. This is no time to say, I can. We know that you can. That is what this message is all about. You may not control the length of your future life, but you certainly do control its degree of usefulness. Well, my friend, the day is drawing to a close. The sun is no longer lighting up the sky. If I am to continue my visit with you, I must turn on the lights. I can see more plainly now. The creative energy is flowing in over the wires, but is meeting with certain resistance within a glass bottle. That resistance creates certain wavelengths that radiate out over the room. I can see the keys of my typewriter again. Man has put a vast store of creative energy to work for the good of relate workers. Of 
course, it was necessary for a man to make certain alterations in the flow of that energy to meet his needs, but there were no other types of energy on this earth for him to use. Nature supplies the basic elements for a man to use, but man must work out his own destiny. It is life force to accomplish our every move. I'm using it to read these lines. I am using it not only to write these lines, but to develop the thoughts I am recording. As we are powerless to our creative energy. I should say that it is no easy task to relate such a tremendously complicated function by the simple words of this stage. Try as I may to simplify, we both know that it will require more than one writing to grasp the marvelous truths here and contained. I urge you to read and reread these pages until these truths become a part of your consciousness. Once you have made these truths a part of your life, life will take on greater value. You will look upon the expression of nature and realize that all products of nature are simply and surely sustained by the creative energy life force. Infinitesimal objects are sustained by the same creative energy. It is the universal life energy force, and we must all adhere to the laws of nature. The laws of nature laws of nature are indisputable and irrevocable. It is in nature. Everybody talks about nature, but have they ever taken the time to determine what nature really is? We look upon the covering of the face of this earth and say, is nature grand? We recognize the beauty and grand of nature, but do we recognize the intelligence and energy that makes such beauty possible? I don't believe that many people think that such beauty just happened. There just had to be an expression of energy, and there must have been an expression of intelligence. All of this became possible because an intelligently directed energy made it possible. To me, nature is simply the expression of the creator, the storehouse of all supply. Every element used by man is supplied by nature. He may borrow such elements and use them as his fancy dictates, but he cannot destroy them. Even in the most complicated compounds, each element retains its individual identity, else how can the chemist break down the compound and identify each ingredient? Nothing can be destroyed, only the form of the compound can be altered. This expression of the creator, which we call nature, presents some mysterious problems that man has not as yet fathomed. But that need not prevent us from continuing our study of nature. Nature is man's sole supplier, no other source. It is, and everything used by man is a product of nature. It borrows from nature plays around with certain elements in his laboratory, attempting to produce a certain form that may be to his liking, but such forms crumble with age and return to the earth. Let us consider the life cycle of all living things on this earth. I believe it will give you a better understanding of the creative expression we call nature. There are numerous forms of organic life on this earth, but they fit into two classifications, animal and vegetable. The purpose of each one being to provide food for the other. One cannot exist without the other, so the balance must be maintained. Anything that causes the destruction of one group will cause secondary destruction of the other. The vegetable kingdom occupies one half of the cycle, and the animal kingdom occupies the other half slash carrot carrot greater than backslash slash oz backslash slash or one backslash carrot ooh. HJ, 7 carat PQ, 2 pounds backslash less than C slash backslash HO slash backslash WO slash 9 slash 2 slash nutritional if we cycle the nutritional values that support the animal body must first pass through the vegetable metabolism and nutritional that support the vegetable cells must first pass through the animal metabolism. All of the plants are eaten by some animal, but when a plant falls to the earth and decays, it is ultimately absorbed by the soil. Every bit of vegetable or animal substance that reaches the soil is devoured by the bacteria present in the soil. Some bacteria belong to the animal kingdom, so nutrients passing through such bacteria will have passed through the animal metabolism before reaching the roots of another plant. 
Thus, nature provides a life cycle for all living things. It appears that one of the laws of nature is anything not used passes to another state. After the devouring and the waste product is deposited in the soil, and it begins again, passing through this nutrition cycle once more. Does the nutrition cycle, as described above, always work? As unless man interferes with such action. Of course, as previously stated, whenever man transgresses nature's law, he must suffer the consequences of his transgressions. Do you recognize the voice of nature? I've spent a long time to listen to the voice of nature. I've learned to read the sign language of nature and to ask anything else I could do except express what nature desired. Of course, there is no audible sound, but nature brings us a message in no uncertain terms. As you are able to read and understand her messages, you feel the real joys of living. You will realize that you are nature, a small part, of course, but all of your being reflects nature. You feel the closeness and the thrill of sensing the vital energy surging through your cells. It's great to realize that you are a part of nature, that you are in nature, and that nature is within you. In presenting you with this natural philosophy of life, I feel a deep sense of responsibility, for I know that the knowledge derived from the study of these pages will completely change your outlook on life. Don't think for one moment that I will endeavor to make that change. Any change that may come into your life will be of your own making. I will only afford you the opportunity to consider such a change. I know myself was a statement made to a careless age a long time ago. Still, man has failed to make a careful analysis of his relationship with nature. Perhaps this is so because man has been so busy trying to improve his standing in society that he has neglected all other phases of life. I don't know the... Temptations of a social climber, for I have no such aspirations, but I do know the pleasure of living in harmony with nature, and I urge all to cultivate such harmony in their lives. Desire backed by determination will allow you to put your knowledge of things natural into operation, and yours will be a more contented life. If you expect to attain your goal, you must live a planned life. Such a life must be so planned as to avoid conflict with the laws of nature. Planning your life's course will afford more time for enjoyment and avoid many of the unpleasantries. Of course, happiness being a state of mind will depend greatly upon the degree of harmony you establish with natural things. Some people set a goal for old age and ignore all of the pleasures they might have arriving there. Look to the pleasure of every hour spent on this earth. Be kind to your fellow man, for he may afford you much pleasure. Most assuredly, I am enjoying old age, but I have also enjoyed those yesteryears. I know that every day will make an indelible impression upon my memory record, and that that record will influence the degree of enjoyment that I may derive from the days that are to come. Above all things, recognize the immutable laws of nature and live in full accord with such laws. I urge you to weigh every statement in this message on your own scales of experience, but make sure that you do not have your thumb on those scales. Put every idea through your own thought mill and come up with a conclusion that will be a guide for your future. Realize that contemplation of your future is a serious matter. A man only has one future, but he can change his plans for that future. Of course, he can never change the past, because the past is a stepping stone to the future. It is always possible to change your plans for tomorrow. that support the vegetable cells must first pass through the animal metabolism. Not all of the plants are eaten by some animal, but 
that a plant falls to the earth and decays, it is ultimately absorbed by the soil. Every bit of vegetable or animal substance that reaches the soil is devoured by the bacteria present in the soil. Some bacteria belong to the animal kingdom, so nutrients passing through such bacteria will have passed through the animal metabolism before reaching the roots of another plant. Thus, nature provides a life cycle for all living things. It appears that one of the laws of nature is anything not used passes to another state. Bacteria devour it, and their waste product is deposited in the soil. Then it begins again, passing through this nutrition cycle once more. Does the nutrition cycle, as described above, always work? Yes, unless man interferes with such action. Of course, as previously stated, whenever man transgresses nature's law, he must suffer the consequences of his transgressions. To recognize the voice of nature, I learned a long time ago to listen to the voice of nature. And to read the sign language of nature, and there wasn't anything else I could do except express what nature desired. Of course, there is no audible sound, but nature brings us a message in no uncertain terms. Once you are able to read and understand her messages, you feel the real joys of living. You will realize that you are nature, only a small part, of course, but all of your being reflects nature. Feel the closeness and the thrill of sensing the vital energy searching for yourselves. Yes, it's great to realize that you are a part of nature. You are in nature, and that nature is within you. In presenting you with this natural philosophy of life, I feel a deep sense of responsibility, for I know that the knowledge derived from the study of these pages will completely change your outlook on life. Don't think for one moment that I will endeavor to make that change. Any change that may come into your life will be of your own making. I will only afford you the opportunity to consider such a change. I know myself was a statement made to a careless age a long time ago. Still, man has failed to make a careful analysis of his relationship with nature. Perhaps this is so because man has been so busy trying to improve his standing in society that he has neglected all other phases of life. I don't know the... Temptations of a social climber, for I have no such aspirations, but I do know the pleasure of living in harmony with nature, and their job to cultivate such harmony in their lives. Desire backed by determination will allow you to put your knowledge of things natural into operation, and yours will be a more contented life. If you expect to attain your goal, you must live a planned life. Such a life must be so planned as to avoid conflict with the laws of nature. Planning your life's course will afford more time for enjoyment and avoid many of the unpleasantries. Of course, happiness being a state of mind will depend greatly upon the degree of harmony you establish with natural things. Some people set a goal for old age and ignore all of the pleasures they might have arriving there. Look to the pleasure of every hour spent on this earth. Be kind to your fellow man, for he may afford you much pleasure. Most assuredly, I am enjoying old age, but I have also enjoyed those yesteryears. I know that every day will make an indelible impression upon my memory record, and that that record influence the degree of enjoyment that I may derive from the days that are to come. Above all things, recognize the immutable laws of nature, and live in full accord with such laws. I urge you to weigh every statement made in this message on your own scales of experience, but make sure that you do not have your thumb on those scales. Put every idea through your own thought mill and come up with a conclusion that will be a guide for your future. Realize that contemplation of your future is a serious matter. Man only has one future, but he can change his plans for that future. Of course, he can never change the past. The past is a stepping stone to the future. It is always possible to change your plans for tomorrow, but when tomorrow is past, it is history, and you cannot change the history of your past. While your experiences in the past may have cost you considerable time and trouble, they may not have been a complete loss. You may have had profitable experiences that will guide you in the future. Who can say what the planting of a single truth may bring forth? You may be the type of person who is easily discouraged, timidly hesitant about pioneering a new field, so you become fearful. It is never conducive to advancement. 
even a good start lacking knowledge of the whole may fail to materialize into accomplishment. One button does not a pair of pants make, but a pair of pants can also be lost due to the lack of a button. Things through. In my search for the facts of life, I recognize that truth is no respecter of person. If one has a monopoly on truth, a fact is just as true when discovered in the field of one room schoolhouse or the garden as it would be promulgated from the ivory halls of the finest university. An educational background may or may not be working for or against you. Stop making excuses and start thinking of something worthwhile. What do you think you look? What you think you do, what you think you are. If you have studied the preceding pages of this message, I am sure you have a pretty good understanding of what constitutes life. It may not be necessary for you to wander, groping aimlessly through the years that lie before you, listening to the words of someone who will tell you that if you will do thus, and so it seems that certain things would happen. You must want to know what they happen, how they happen, and what part you play or should play in making them happen. If you have absorbed the truths contained in this message, you know that it is possible for you to fulfill your most cherished desires, providing, of course, your desires are in harmony with the laws of nature. However, selfish desires are not in such accord. You must learn to share your life with others who are entitled to the good things in life, but so is your fellow man. Philosophy of cooperation is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Whatever you would like me to do to you, you should be willing to do back to me. So we're going to do just what we want other people to do to us, and we'll have no trouble with other human beings. The golden rule is more the human element, but it certainly does apply to the man slash nature relationship. The prudent desire, supported by faith in yourself, plus a sound knowledge of nature's laws, will assure you of an opportunity to gain health, happiness, and prosperity. But you must think your way through life. Best of all, you will know the whys and wherefores of a successful life. The truths in this message are provocative, compelling thought, and the mere fact you are studying these pages, as it was late or otherwise, indicates you are a seeker of truth. Someone once said it is divided into three terms that which was, which is, and which will be let us learn from the past to profit by the present, and from the present to live better for the future. It may be that you are approaching application of the Shackley philosophy with a slight sense of fear. I am not condemning you for feeling that twinge of fear. I urge you, however, to cooperate with nature, or you can't make it on your own. What are you afraid of? Certainly not of nature. She is always on your side and shall never let you down. If that touch of fear founded in your irrevocable past, the ever fleeting present, the impending future, do you actually know why you have that sense of fear? Most fears are grounded in ignorance of the truth. We fear that which we fail to understand. It would appear then that understanding should begin with ourselves. I believe that the foundation has already been laid for your victory over fear. There can be but one answer cooperate with nature. A good understanding of nature provides all of us with the courage to meet most situations head on. It is true that we humans are prone to imitate the humble sheep. We just follow the leader, taking the course of least resistance. Our lives can be tremendously enriched by studying the expression of nature. It may help if only we were to become aware of the struggle some of nature's products must endure, for man is not the only one of nature's products that must struggle for his existence. The lovely dandelion, for instance, did you ever start mowing your lawn more often than usual in order to clip off the dandelion that's before they had time to develop the seed, only to find that they produced their seed much faster and much lower to the ground than usual? Keep on mowing that lawn every few days and watch what happens. The dandelion will begin to produce seed the moment it comes through the ground. The two is a product of nature and is being directed by the creative intelligence. The first law of nature is self-preservation of one species. Self-preservation, or the will to live, dominates us all. Some years ago, I witnessed a demonstration of self-preservation as practiced by the muskox in the Alaskan wilderness. Those vicious animals were legal prey for the hunter in Alaska and considered a prize trophy. There, not to hunt wild animals. 
samples, but to collect laboratory specimens of the vegetable. I found the tundra and mountainsides, which came upon a herd of what I at first thought were cattle, despite the fact that I knew that none of our domestic cattle could possibly exist in that climate. About a mile away, and they paid no attention to our approach until we were within a few hundred yards of them. And with what appeared to be a determined gait, they performed a perfect military movement and formed a circle. We pulled up our horses to a full stop as these muskox presented a solid wall of heads and horns for their defense and seemed quite determined to stand the ground. It was a threatening formation, I assure you. The shaggy heads of the adults formed the outer rim of the circle, their horns glistening in the subdued light while within stood a circle of calves. There was no doubt in my mind that those shaggy looking beasts meant to protect not only their own lives, but the lives of their offspring. They made no threatening gesture to warn us, but remained prepared for any emergency. We bowed to the inevitable and headed for camp. So, in the face of danger, dispel your fears and stand your ground, just as the Alaskan muskox does. There's absolutely no reason why you should adopt the limitations someone else may place upon your life. Start planning your future accomplishments now. Limitations will be exactly what you make them. Everything that is needed has already been provided. It's just waiting for you to prepare yourself to receive it. Use it. Creative intelligence provides the thought process. The creative energy provides the power. But only you can direct that power. There is nothing mysterious about such occurrences. They happen every day. They say they never happen to me. Of course not if you never produce the thoughts to make them happen. That is what you think to make it. Can man think his way into failure? Yes, and many do. Your thoughts lead to failure. There are discouraging thoughts or creative thoughts. As a human being, you are granted dominion over all things pertaining to your well-being. But have you claimed your inheritance? Don't say TT won't work for me. It is working for you if you are thinking clearly. Every action in nature is directed by the creative intelligence, animal and vegetable. Those of us who have had the opportunity of studying intelligence of wild animals in their natural habitat will agree that man's educated intelligence is match for the instinctive intelligence of the wild animal. Not that man does possess an instinctive intelligence, or he too receives the thoughts of creative intelligence. It is just that man relies too much upon his own educated intelligence. We have a sea of creative energy as well as a sea of creative intelligence. Creative thoughts are constantly bombarding our inner consciousness, but because of our ego, we fail to recognize them. How many times have you felt an urge to do something that your educated mind told you would not work? How many times have you given into your educated consciousness only to find that it would have worked out to your advantage had you recognized the value of that urge? Nor is this life force confined to the animal body alone. The same creative energy is expressed in the vegetable kingdom. From the tiny blade of grass to the mighty redwood tree, every expression of life and growth is due to the flow of creative energy. Man is a brother to all living things, animal or vegetable. Burned out with the same life force, once you have absorbed these truths, you can feel more at home with the creatures of nature. Enjoy the forest more, and you will gain greater confidence and satisfaction just strolling through the garden, where you will feel a kinship with all things. So you will be able to read nature's messages in all living things, and you will appreciate more the privilege afforded man, and be thankful you are alive. Where nature speaks, we speak, but where nature is silent, we are silent. What benefits will you gain from the study message such as this? That depends upon how thirsty it is studied and analyzed and how much is absorbed. The truths here and revealed will never become old and outdated. Feel deeply grateful for the privilege of placing this message in your hands. The principles set forth on these pages are simple ones and can be followed by anyone. There is one thing that must be remembered, however. The sign on the side of the road gives certain directions to aid in reaching a destination, but it cannot go with the traveler. Sign is to be of any value, it must be memorized and understood. I am giving you helpful directions to a healthier, happier, and more prosperous future. You 
um, and put them into operation in the context of your own life. You will find in these pages full and complete directions for the development of a healthier, happier, and more prosperous life. I've traveled this trail for over three quarters of a century. Most of the trail was hewn out of the wilderness. I have tried to mark the trail so others might follow with these. In the preceding pages, I hope that I have set forth certain facts that will make your journey through life more pleasant. I have kept my message as simple as possible, but truths, no matter how simple, require time for absorption. Start with an open mind. Make sure that it is the truth that you are seeking. Remember, there may be some valuable truths regarding man's relationship with nature and her loss that have not it's been five brought to your attention. As I fully expect that some of these truths may set some of your pet theories and cause some disturbance in your habits of living, but let me assure you that I know the Shackley philosophy to be workable, for it has been a part of my life for many years. I know of no magic power that will bring success to anyone's life overnight. There is nothing mystical or supernatural here that will do so. But you will find this philosophy of life as modern as the atomic age, yet as old as the earth itself. I know that you will not fail if you really desire to accomplish your purpose. Intensity and quality of thought power at your disposal is beyond question. For a part of nature, it's only a matter of properly directing the power into the production of natural values. You are at the beginning. Slash, the founder of one of America's most successful business organizations, has evolved a cogent working plan for living that has produced dramatic personal achievement for him. Many thousands touched daily by his enterprises. It is a reflection of one man's life in his search for what man is and why he is. Mr. Shackley's personal philosophy of living in comparison with nature has extended not only into the business policies and products of the company he founded, but into personal and ethical relationships that reach great dis chances and years. This pattern for life can be a valuable guide to achievement of personal happiness, satisfaction, and success. Called by numerous thousands of Shalkley family members, the Shackley philosophy is a constructive, creative, and stimulating opportunity to assess one's relationship with nature.